Honorable, the Chief Justice of the Philippines and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the Philippines. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons having written before the Honorable Supreme Court of the Philippines shall give their attention for the court is now in session. Your Honours, good afternoon. This is a continuation of the oral arguments for the 37 consolidated petitions assailing Republic Act 11479, the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020. May I request the representing councils to please present, I mean, uh, make your appearances. Good afternoon, Your Honors, Mr. Chief Justice. Attorney Jose Anselmo I. Cadiz, for Petitioner Integrated Bar of the Philippines and uh, the Governors of the, of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines in GR 253624, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Respectfully appearing as counsel for petitioners in GR 252741, Attorney Jose Manuel Diocno, uh, ready, Your Honors. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Respectfully appearing for petitioners, Justice Antonio T. Carpio, Justice Conchita Carpio Morales, UP Law Professors, in GR number 252736, Your Honor. I am Alfredo B. Molo III, Your Honors. We are ready. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Evelyn Ursua respectfully appearing for the petitioners NGR number 252747 and UJP et al., Your Honors. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Edsel Tagman, same appearance for the petitioners in the GR number 252579. Good afternoon po, Your Honors. Uh, uh, appearing for, respectfully appearing for uh, petitioners of 252585, Your Honors, please. Uh, Neri Colmenares po. Assalamu alaikum, Your Honors. Appearing for GR number 252759, I'm attorney Algamar Latif, Your Honor. We are ready, Your Honor. For the respondent. One, two, three, sir. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Your Honors. Uh, Chief Justice Diosdado M. Peralta, Honorable Justices of the Court, good afternoon. Uh, appearing as counsel for the respondents, Your Honors, are the following Assistant Solicitor General Marisa de la Cruz Galandines, <clears throat> ASG Rex. Bernardo L. Pascual, ASG Raymond I. Rigodon, State Solicitor Eduardo Pocis Jr., Associate Solicitor Kyle Brian Guerrero, and the Solicitor General, Your Honors. Uh, Your Honor, Your Honors, there is a super winning event. After the conclusion of the oral arguments, 
last February 2, 2021. This will affect not only the continuance of the oral argument, but the resolution of the pending petitions as well. Hence, I beg leave to be heard on an urgent oral manifestation, Your Honors. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, um, Sir Solicitor General. Thank you, Your Honor. I am submitting to the Clerk of Court and Bank three video clips. I am submitting to the clerk of court and back three video clips. And now I'm showing before you the first of the three. 15 copies of the transcript and the affidavits authenticating the video are submitted herewith to the clerk of court. Uh, Uh, may, uh, may, uh, may I interrupt you for a while, uh, Mr. Solicitor General? Because you just uh, have given us this uh, document. Can you just uh, summarize what you want to manifest yes. Yes, yeah, for economic purposes? Uh, the video clip and accompanying uh, affidavits, which were subscribed before the PAO, PAO, were attached to the endorsement to the Office of the Solicitor General, duly signed by Provincial Legal Officer of the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples, or NCIP, in Sambales. The NCIP and PAO are reportedly the new council of Gurung and Ramos, the two ETAs, Your Honors. In addition to the video clip, Gurung and Ramos executed a pinag, pinagsamang salaysay ng pag-uurong, stating as follows. In number two, uh, number two, ayaw po naming pirmahan ang mga dokumento referring to the petition in intervention. Napilitan na rin kaming pumirma. Dinigyan po kami ng isang libo at hatiin daw po namin. In number five of that salaysay, sets, sinabihan pa nga ako na di ka ba naawa sa abogada? Galing pa siya sa Manila para papirmahin ka lang. Unquote. In paragraph 6, it says, Nakiusap din ako na sana 
Lubayan nyo ang magulang ko. Number 11, aming inuurong ang petition and intervention na aming napirmahan sa kadahilanang hindi bukal sa aming puso at kapasyahan ang pagpirma. It may be recalled that during the last hearing, the Honorable Justice Leonen asked whether the court should wait for an actual case before it weighs in on the constitutionality of the law. The Honorable Justice even hinted that maybe the ETA case would provide an actual controversy to warrant this Honorable Court's exercise of its power of judicial review. Mindful of this predicament beforehand, and in a desperate attempt to establish actual justiciable controversy in these consolidated petitions, the NUPL, representing Bagong Aliansang Makabayan, in GR number 252733, Barangay Maglaking San Carlos City, Pangasinan, Sangguniang Kabataan in GR number 252921, and Coordinating Council for the People's Development and Governments in GR number 253242, filed before this Honorable Court a motion for leave to file petition in intervention for Gurong and Ramos. Gurong and Ramos are presently facing criminal charges for violations of the Anti-Terrorism Act before the Regional Trial Court in Olongapo. It must be remembered that in Abogado et al. versus BENR et al., our fisher folks from Palawan and Zambales who were victims of deception disowned the petitions filed in their behalf for the issuance of writs of kalikasan and continuing mandamus over the Panatag Shoal, Panganiban Reef, and Ayungin Shoal. In said case, this Honorable Court is sternly warned the councils to be mindful of their duties and obligations under the Code of Professional Responsibility, and that the same or similar infractions in the future shall be dealt with more severely. Um, excuse me, Mr. Solicitor General. Will you allow me to interrupt you? The petition for intent version filed by the would be interveners has been unanimously denied by us this morning. So is there still a need for you to read all of those documents because we have already denied the petition for intervention? Now, if you, if you want to push through with what you want to manifest to us, you want to move to us this afternoon, I believe that uh, you put that in writing so that the other party can comment on that later on so that we can already proceed with our, our arguments this afternoon. Yes, okay, so yes, uh, Congressman Colmenares. Hello. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd just like to react about this latest development alleging that lawyers of NUPL uh, were forced, forced the uh, interveners, Your Honors. In, in the first place, Your Honor, we are not aware of this latest uh, development, but it is really strange why lawyers can force a detainee inside a PNP camp that's really outrageous, Your Honors. And secondly, we would like to inquire from lawyers uh, who signed the inter who counsels to the intervention whether, when the respondents talked to the uh, to the uh, petitioners, was their counsel also at the time, Your Honor? Because it seems that uh, we are really unaware of this. So uh, the court has said that uh, the uh, intervention has been denied. However, we would like to, uh, if the manifestation is filed by the Solicitor General, Your Honor, we would like to respond to that, Your Honor, uh, in proper time, Your Honor. Let, let us wait for their motion. Okay. Anyway, anyway, it is only a manifestation, so there is no yet motion. 
Thank you. So if they want to pursue through emotion, then uh, let us wait for the emotion. If there is none, then you can sleep well. Thank you. Okay. So let's now proceed with the oral arguments. Uh, Justice uh, Marvick Lonin can uh, continue with the interpolation. Is uh, Attorney Latif here in the session hall? Yeah. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu Your Honors. I am sorry that during your opening statement, you mentioned that there was still this discrimination against uh, the Muslim population in this country, and that there seems to be an impression, according to your opening statement, that uh, most of the terrorist acts come from uh, Muslim Filipinos. Am I correct in hearing your opening statement. That is correct, Your Honor. Yes, and, uh, but then on the other hand, uh, you are aware that there have been terrorist incidents in many places in Mindanao, as well as in the environs of Metro Manila. Yes, that is correct, Your Honor. For example, in, on February 27, 2004, this was the super ferry incident. You remember this, uh, where there were 116 people that were killed due to a bomb that was hidden in a television that was loaded into Super Ferry Number 14. Out of the 116 people, six children less than five years old, nine children between six and 16, and six students sent from Northern Mindanao to a journalism competition were killed. You're yes, aware of this? Yes, in general, Your Honor. I'm and uh, would you recall, uh, who the perpetrators were as found by our uh, Philippine National Police and our ISAP? I am not aware of the- identity. You've heard of the Raha Sulaiman movement, correct? Yes, I recall yes. your- uh, they, they are of a different kind of jurisprudence in Islam. I believe uh, Salafi, uh, jihadists. And do you know who trained them? I do not know, Your Honor. Abu Sayyaf and Jemaya Islamiyah. Uh, particularly the Jemaya Islamiyah with links to Al-Qaeda in 2004. Uh, I'm not aware. Yes. Uh, and you know where Jemaya Islamiyah comes from? I recall, Your Honor, that they're, they're from Indonesia, Your Honor. Most of them are in Indonesia. And our links with the Philippines, according to intelligence reports, at least when I was working with the executive branch, and I believe that at a certain point, our national security advisor, I believe, is he here? Um, General Esperon, is he here? Or no? Uh, but at, at, at a certain point, maybe our national security advisor or perhaps the Solicitor General can share with us that there are indeed, um, shall we say, transits of several uh, high value targets or uh, terrorists wanted internationally through uh, our back door, specifically Mindanao. You understand that? Yes, Your Honor, I'm aware of that, Your Honor. Yes. And 116 people means there are 116 families. Six children less than five years old in 2004, nine children between six and 16 year old, six students from Northern Mindanao for a journalism contest. You agree with me that this was a terrorist act? Yes, I agree with you, Your Honor. Yes, this was in 2004. Um, I can go through uh, the incidents in 2017. So in Basilan, kidnapping and execution, July 5. Basilan, July 30, kidnapping ex execution. Seven Filipino loggers were beheaded in two separate towns in Basilan. August 5, Mindanao, five MILF guerrillas killed in a landmine blast while running after BIFF militants in the area. August 21, 2017, Maluso, Basilan. August 29, in Sulu, three people of the Muslim clan were killed in a battle with the Abu Sayyaf group, uh, July 31, 2018, bombing in Lamitan City, August 28, in Isulan, Sok Sargen, bombing, also se uh, September 2, January 27, 2019, Holo, Sulu, a cathedral bombing, 20 people were killed, 82 others wounded during the mass at Holo Cathedral following uh, two explosions. Uh, this was the Jama'a Ansharut Daula group. Uh, particularly Ruli Rian Zike and Ulfa Handayani Sade 
with the Abu Sayyaf Ajang Ajang faction. And then, of course, the latest in my record is the August 24, 20 Holo bombing, where jihadists de detonated two bombs, killing 14 people, wounding 17 others. The first bomb was detonated while the army was carrying out COVID humanitarian efforts. And the second bomb was exploded inside the Our Lady of Mount Carmel Cathedral. You are familiar that mm -hmm. these incidents do happen within our uh, territory. Yes, Your Honor, I'm aware yes. of that, Your Honor. And you are aware, therefore, that terrorism is really something which is very real, correct? Yes, it is real. Yes, so it is not only something that is against, let us say, the CPP, NPA, NDF, but uh, there are a lot of other groups coming to our shores, whether um, uh, alleged jihadists, because I know that uh, in Islam, uh, jihad can mean so many things. And there is uh, really a correct interpretation of jihad in the Quran, not what is carried by the Salafi. Am yes. I correct? Yes, Your Honor. Jihad, Your Honor, is, means, Your Honor, self-struggle, Your, self Your Honor. And it, oh, it collectively, Your Honor, it is uh, equivalent in our jurisprudence, Your Honor, is yes. self-preservation, Your Honor. And not only um, religious extremists that become violent and therefore do terrorist acts, but there are, let us say, rightist groups all over the world, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. So correct. this concept of terrorism is very real. Is that not correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Yes. And therefore, uh, would you agree with me that it is right for government to find a way to address terrorism? Yes, we totally agree with the government, Your yes. Honor. And uh, let me make an analogy. Um, before a car crashes, before a, a, a speeding car crashes into a wall or killing several pedestrians, there is a law which regulates speeding. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. And therefore, even before the harm is done, it is important that for certain kinds of uh, uh, acts, uh, government looks at prevention or suppression. Uh, of the of particular acts before they happen. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. Would you not think that terrorism is a kind of act, regardless of how it is defined now, but in the general concept of terrorism, and I think you and I know the Lamitan incident, super ferry incident, the Holo bombing, in, uh, the Holo Cathedral bombing, these are the core concepts of terrorism. That we should not wait until it happens, that we should uh, give our uh, law enforcers whether it's the PNP or the ESAP or whatever intelligence agency that we have, the tools in order to be able to uh, detect, and more importantly, not only to detect and prosecute, but to actually uh, disperse or uh, disturb uh, the actual incident. Is that not correct? That is correct, Your Honor. And a committed terrorist, a committed terrorist, whether a rightist, a leftist, a religious extremist, or e even an, an environmental anarchist, all of them, when they are committed, of course, while the act is doing and while they have co-conspirators, it is important that we cut the means of communication with each other so that the entire incident is disrupted. Is that, isn't that correct? Yes, correct, Your Honor. So there is a criminal uh, part of it, which is to prosecute and convict in order that it becomes a deterrent and to prevent for the future. But in terms of addressing terrorism, there is also the law enforcement part to try to suppress so that it will not happen. Is that not correct? Yes, you know, that is correct. Yes. Um, and as a matter of fact, under international law, there have been two basic approaches to attending to, uh, attending to terrorist uh, acts. The first approach is, of course, um, considering it as a threat to international peace. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. And as a threat to international peace, of course, it's the Security Council that is involved. And normally, therefore, it is the executive part, the commanders in chief of various agencies that can do preemptive acts, like the United States doing a preventive act against Al Qaeda or uh, the ISIS, etc., or to address it as a uh, part of armed conflict. Is that not correct? That is correct, Your And Honor. that is true for, let us say, the Abu Sayyaf, certain parts of it. And of course, uh, what is now called as the Bangsamoro Islamic Freedom Fighters, somewhere in Maguindanao and its environs. Is that not correct? Yes, that is correct. Yes. Yeah. But there is also the other part, which is for uh, criminalizing this, these acts. 
and therefore for the criminalization of these acts, the proper laws must be promulgated and the acts must be uh, stated. Is that not correct? Yes, that is correct. What happens if the Philippines does not have a law that is against terrorism? We may be sanctioned, Your Honor, by the United Nations, United C Nations Security Council. Security Council. I'm glad you said that because I did hear one of the councils, uh, I think it was Attorney King Orsua during the past, saying that there are no sanctions coming from the Security Council. But uh, I'm glad you said that. I do not have to show to you the provisions in Article, in Chapter 7 of uh, the UN Charter, that indeed uh, the Security Council, uh, Council may uh, sanction uh, any state party to the UN, UN uh, Charter if they do not follow their, uh, their bidding or their requirements. Okay, so we have these uh, types of, uh, uh, types of uh, um, obligations. Apart from that, apart from the sanctions, what can happen to us if we do not have and we do not participate in the international effort to prevent, suppress, and criminalize and address uh, terrorism? We may be isolated from the international world. Not honest. only that, do you think that we will become a safe haven? That is correct, Your Honor. Yes, because they will not be able to go to our neighboring countries like Malaysia, they have very strict rules, or Singapore, or even Indonesia for that matter. Then they will actually use uh, the hinterlands or our places in Mindanao, correct? That is correct. Your yes, Honor. and as a matter of fact, I, I'm not sure if you are aware that uh, Marwan, was located in Mindanao, correct? Yes, that is correct. Your yes, Honor. he was uh, the object of uh, the Mama Sapano incident, correct? That, yes, that is and correct. And you are also aware that many of the international high value targets will go to Mindanao, marry a Filipina, usually from one of the communities to get protection with them. Is that not correct? Yes, that is the yes. case of Marwan. So the concept of us becoming a safe haven might be actually happening even as we speak. Is that not correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Yes. If, therefore, we do not comply with international law or what is called by the uh, Security Council in terms of preventing, suppressing, and attending to uh, terrorism, that we will become the paria because we will be training the bombers that will go to Malaysia, to Indonesia, to Hong Kong, to the United States of America, as probably... We, we, we had some connection with the 9-11 incident. Is that not correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Yes. So therefore, it is important that our laws are not only uh, backward, not only rudimentary, but they must be state of the art in order to equip our law enforcers with respect to attending to terrorism. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. And would you say that this court, in assessing the constitutionality of the provisions, must also take that into consideration, not only our domestic parochial concerns, but also the reality that terrorism is an international phenomenon. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, social media can create epistemic bubbles. Is that not correct? That is correct. Yes, and that is the way that many of our disenchanted youth may be radicalized using that particular uh, uh, medium. Is that not correct? That is correct, Your Honor. And, uh, would you agree with me that, as a matter of fact, there have been reports by, by our intelligence agencies, and perhaps, again, the Solicitor General can present uh, the reports at some, some point, that uh, in Syria, in Afghanistan, there were Filipino militants who made their way to those places as part of Mujahideen uh, during the time that uh, they were trying to repel the Russian forces, and then as a follow-on, going to Syria and going to places where ISIS was present. Is that not correct? Based on my reading on the newspaper, Your Honor. It's possible, correct? Yes. yes. And, uh, and uh, the truth is, of course, even the Marawi incident has international connections. Isn't that correct? I am not aware, Your Honor. Yes. So would you agree with me that when this court assesses what the Congress did, we have to take into consideration the kind of standard required under the UN Security Council resolutions, as well as the ability of our country's law enforcers and intelligence agencies to be able to cooperate with other intelligence agencies because terrorism knows no borders. Is that not correct? Compliance with international uh, body like the United Nations Security Council, Your Honor, it must comply with our constitution, yes. Your Honor. And we have to do this not because we want to discriminate against the Moro or the Muslim. 
Okay, and Moro and Muslim are two different things. You agree with me, Attorney Latif? Yes, I agree with you. Yes, Anna. Moro has something to do with ethnicity to a particular locality. Um, Bangsamoro, for instance, in Mindanao, Muslim is a adherence to a religion, and one of us can be Muslim here, although not Moro. Is that not correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Yes, and therefore, uh, the reason that we also do this is not merely to discriminate against the Moro or the Muslim, but to protect. Because most of the bombs that I have surveyed from 2004 to 2020 have happened in Mindanao, although there were, of course, other incidents of my personal knowledge having dealt with the security cluster in an administration past where there were actually successful interventions done by law enforcers to prevent actual terrorist acts. Would you agree with me? I cannot agree with you, Your Honor, because in terms because you have of no law knowledge. enforcement, Your Honor. Yes. Uh, and would you agree with me that in certain instances where they were able to interdict at that time, uh, they told me, Intelligence agencies told me that they did whatever they needed to do, despite the fact that the law was not yet the kind of law that we had, in order to be able to prevent a bombing, let us say, in a fiesta in, Lag in uh, Laguna and Quezon, or the Quiapo, uh, what do you call this? Translation. You do not know, of course. Yeah, yes. Know, but but uh, the truth is that, would you agree with me that uh, we cannot... Uh, stereotype all our intelligence agencies and all our intelligence personnel as people who want to violate human rights. But you, would you agree with me that there are people within that organization, the Army, the ESAP, the NICA, the NSA, that really fervently want to try to stop this kind of incidents from happening ever again? Is that not correct? That is correct, Your Honor. But yes, and you know, of course, that they are on a 24-7 watch basis that they, they do not know which ci civilian, from where, et cetera, that uh, this next uh, attack will be coming from. Yes, you know. Yes. So, in other words, that a terrorism law is essential, correct? In the case of Marawi, Your Honor, it is not essential because they were those... Uh, no, no, in general, a terrorism law is essential. Yes, Your Honor. An anti-terrorism law is essential. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, and we must take care that when we rule upon the provisions of this law or this act, that the law enforcers are not left with nothing in terms of being able to address this uh, horror of modern society. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Let's just go to a de definition of terms only for purposes of this interpolation. Extremism is different from terrorism. Would you agree with me? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Extremism is a belief. Terrorism is the method. Would you agree with me? The method, Your Honor, is violence. As a yes, reason, terrorism, yes, Your which Honor. is a form of violence, yes, Your Honor. writ large, in yes. order to sow fear and yes. compulsion and intimidation that is in correct, Section Your 4, correct? Yes, yes, Your Honor. So extremism can mean, for example, that I'm a Marxist. It means that the normative being liberalism, maybe, maybe among the 15 justices here, maybe uh, liberal, uh, left of center, right of center, whatever. But when I am a Marxist, within the normative framework, I am an extremist. Is that not correct? It can be, Your Honor. If I am a Marxist, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And even if I'm a Marxist, there are many shades of Marxism. Would you agree with me? Yes, Your Honor. There is a Marxist-Leninist, correct? Yes, and Maoist, There's, Your Honor. Yes, Marxist-Leninist, Maoist, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Can you point to a Marxist-Leninist Maoist in the session hall? No, I'm just kidding. No, I okay. cannot do that. Uh, but those are belief systems, correct? Yes, it is, it is combined with the realm yes. of thought, Your Honor. Yes, and there are Marxists which are later-day Marxists. There's the young Marx, there's the mature Marx. And there are Marxists uh, from the critical school in Frankfurt. Um, Marcuse, uh, Althusser, uh, Adorno, etc. These are also Marxists, correct? I'm not aware yes, of that. Yes, and there are also feminist Marxists, correct? Mm -hmm. Angela Davis, etc. Right? Yes, okay. Your Honor. So therefore, a belief in this system is not terrorism, correct? Yes, you know. We, are, we have to be clear about that, yes, right? Your Honor. There is even a brand of Islam that hues closely to Marxism. Is that not true? As the same way that in Islam there are various schools of thought. You agree with me? Yes, that is correct. Yes, and there is the Sunni Shiai, Shiai. There Shiite. is the Maliki. There is the etc. Many many schools, correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Yes, there's even the uh, 
romantic uh, Sufism, correct? Yes, Sufism. And yeah. are you a Sufist? No, Your Honor. No, but uh, like Rumi, etc. Mm -hmm. the, the beautiful poems of Rumi, uh, going to tantric uh, methods, etc. Uh, but the, the, the point there is there are various shades of bar various beliefs, correct? So extremism is different from terrorism. Is that not correct? Yes. The one as, a, is... as a matter of fact, part of the reason why the UN General Assembly hesitated to come out with a resolution prior to 49-60 in 1994 was because certain third world countries said that the freedom fighter is not a terrorist. You agree with me? Yes, Your Honor. But in that resolution in 1994, they separated. Whatever terrorist act you do, you cannot justify. You can never justify by means of an ideology or a philosophy. Is that not correct? That is correct, Your Honor. So we punish the method, but not the ideology, correct? Yes. So let me be very clear with you. You agree with me that this court should say that extremism should never be punished. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor, because that is within the realm of thought. Then it Whether is you're rightist, you're the most rightist person in the world, you believe in fascism and totalitarianism, rightist method, or the most leftist, but you believe also in leftist totalitarianism, uh, the vanguard party, the proletariat as the vanguard party, the dictatorship of the proletariat. Whatever your belief is, that should not be punished. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. It's even covered in an international convention, correct? Yes, Your Honor. It's uh, Article 19 of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, Paragraph A. Is that not correct? Yes, freedom of thought, Your Honor. And freedom of opinion and embedded in uh, this country. So when General Parlade says his point, that he is offended by the statements made by the communists, that speech is also protected, correct? It is protected, Your Honor, but he is accountable uh, because he is uh, an official of the military. Honor, yes. Will government. you prosecute that kind of speech? Yes, Your Honor. You will prosecute that kind of speech, but you will not prosecute the kind of speech uh, saying that uh, we should um, destabilize government in order to be able to rebuild. As Vladimir Ilyich Lenin said, a new society can only be had under the womb of an old one. Correct? That is correct, by the Honor. way, did I commit a terrorist act by stating the statement or paraphrasing Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, who, by the way, is not my relative, correct? Mm -hmm. But no, I did not, correct? Yes, Your Honor. I only made a statement of belief or faith or even a philosophy or a political point of view, correct? That, That's, is correct, that should Your not Honor. be punished. So we, we should make that distinction, correct? That is so correct, So let me Honor. summarize. You agree with me that this court should take care that there is an anti-terrorism law that stands because it is part of our international obligation. That as a matter of fact, we should balance the way we read the Constitution in such a way that we comply also with our international commitments without, of course, undermining the basic values and principles contained in the Constitution. Is that not correct? We already complied with the honor with the human security, enactment of the human security law, Your Honor. Your opinion, but again, yes, as I was saying, uh, this court must take that as a principle in terms of interpreting this new law, correct? Yes, as long as it will not increase because the Constitution. Because, of course, you, be, you agree with me. We cannot tell Congress and the Senate, you made a mistake. You should have just stuck with the old law, correct? That's yes. a matter of policy, correct? Thank you. Your Our yes, only justification for saying you should go back to the old law is when we, do, we find that the repealing clause is also null and void and that we find a reason under the Constitution. Is that not correct? That is correct. We cannot yeah. substitute our judgment, right? That is correct. Yes. Yeah. By the way, do you know any of us as having been able to implement or interdict a terrorist? I have no knowledge now, of we that. Are, none of us are law enforcers, except I think uh, our newest justice was a prosecutor, but that's not law enforcement. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. I, I think also Justice uh, Salameda was a prosecutor, one of the best prosecutors this country has produced, uh, Justice, Justice Jolo, Salameda. Justice uh, Rodil Salameda. Oh, and of course, if I'm not mistaken, the Chief Justice, uh, whose judge was the strictest also in this world, uh, Justice uh, Romy Calleja, who is now our JID. But none of us have ever been law enforcers. Is that not correct? That is correct, Your Honor. And we have no basis to say that the old law was not effect was less effective or more effective 
to interdict terrorists than the present law. Is that not correct? That is your job, Your Honor, as the magistrate to interpret the law. Yes, but we cannot say which one is the more effective to the intelligence uh, component, the army, the police, the Navy has their own intelligence component, etc., because none of us have ever been there. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor, because... We have to rely on manifestations and evidence that is presented, correct? That is correct, Your So Honor. when one of you tells us that there was already enough law, enough mechanism prior to this law in order to interdict the Lamitan bombing, etc., we will have to take that with a grain of salt, correct? Because have, has any of the petitioners' counsels been in the position of a law enforcer, specifically those that go after terrorists? That was a question. Have any of the petitioners' counsels, the ones here now, in your knowledge, been in the position to enforce the anti-terror law and to go after a terrorist? I have no knowledge, and perhaps your honor none. Uh, I know Attorney Evelyn Orsua, no. I know uh, Professor Molo, no. I, I know Attorney Jokno, no. I know Attorney Cadiz, no. I know, of course, Congressman Lagman is a, uh, the wise man of the House of uh, Representatives, but I do not know whether he has implemented or gone after a terrorist. Um, am I correct? Yes, Your Honor, yes, but so, we did not raise it in our petition, Your Honor. So we cannot uh, give a lot of uh, weight to a statement that the old law was more effective than the new one, correct? Now, to your knowledge, how many have been convicted under the old law? Under the old law, to my recollection, if I may correct, Your Honor, there was only one as accessory. This is a case in Regional Trial Court of mid -Sayab, and it was by virtue of a plea bargaining agreement, Your Honor. So, so, many, fact, Honor, so many incidents, yet only one prosecution. Yes, including, yes. Your Honor, the Marawi City, Your Honor. They were not charged with the... Uh, under Human Security Act, they were charged with rebellion. Yes. So, isn't that precisely the point? There is a law on terrorism, Your Honor, and, in, and it is not applied yes. to them. So, and I do not know why, what, why we yes, need another law like this, Your Honor. Yes, and probably the during his turn will explain to us why the, why the agencies under his representation felt that there needed to be a new law. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, but the other takeaway is extremism is different from terrorism, correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Yes, and extremism should be allowed because... It is within the realm of... Two. There's no overt... Freedom of expression. But freedom of ex expression by itself does not have value unless there is a philosophical idea behind it, correct? That is correct, Your yes, Honor. Yes, and John Stuart Mill said, even the false idea is important. Even a false opinion is important because it enables those that in the majority and the, in the status quo to reveal how they will refute that false idea. And therefore, again, to reiterate the values of the government in terms of that particular false idea. And therefore, the best test of truth is that it is tested in the market. Is that not correct? Yes, that is the meaning yes. of democracy, Your Honor. Democracy, therefore, means that every person can be able to speak their mind, correct? That is correct, okay. Your Honor. Freedom of expression is protected but not conduct. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, and conduct can become expressive, like burning a flag, for example, right? So that can be part of freedom of expression, correct? That is correct, Your Honor. But certainly violence is not part of protected speech, even though it is expressive, correct? Yes, Your Honor, that is If I am right. so angry with a certain person, I cannot do violence against that person, even if I say that's part of my expression. That's not allowed, correct? That is not allowed, Your Because Honor. you curtail the ability of that person to respond to you uh, without coercion in, in the open. And therefore, you undermine the value of freedom of expression. Is that not correct? That is correct, Your Honor. So we punish violence, and therefore, it is legitimate that violence is criminalized, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, and that violence can be, or the act to commit a violent act, the intention to commit a violent act, uh, you can punish it, as according to you a while ago, you can punish it even if it is at that stage of overt acts towards that uh, conclusion. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. And that's section four, A, B, C, D, E. With respect, Your Honor, to the proviso, Your Honor, in section four, I think... No, no, not the proviso. A, B, C, D, E. In section A, B, and C, Your Honor. Engages in acts, overt is, act, intended, and the cause is serious harm, correct? That is correct, Your So Honor. there is an overt act. Look, 
engage in acts, letter A. Letter B, engage in acts. C, engage in acts. D, develops, modif modi uh, manufactures, etc. E, releases. Overt acts, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, and as you said, before the accident actually happens, you can prevent it from happening, right? That is correct, Your That's Honor. why there is no attempt, frustrated stages. Because that is the idea in the concept of addressing, preventing terrorism. Is that not correct? There must be an act committed first, Your Honor. Yes. An act which may not have caused the bodily injury yet, but it is in the process of committing. That's where the intent becomes the connection, correct? There may be act, Your Honor, which is con constitutionally protected, Your Honor, which may have an, in an intended effect, Your Honor. That yes, but I will, I will leave it at, at that because I am sure that my colleagues who are more experts in criminal law than myself will interrogate you on, or some of your counsels on that particular incident because I heard one of you say that the law punishes intent, not act. This, is, this uh, issue, Your Honor, is being discussed by one of my colleagues, Your Honor. Yes, I think I they are proper to answer that. Yes, that's why I will call him later. And thank you very much, Attorney Latif. Uh, for that very enlightening discussion, can, now, can I now ask You're welcome, Your Attorney Neri Colmenares? What is that section regarding? Um, you discussed the section regarding. Um, I think you have uh, overstepped. Your Honor. You have overstepped your boundary. That is for the sole gen. Oh, yes. sorry. That's usurpation. Baka ka to. Okay. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Yes. yes. Okay. Now, uh, what is that section regarding arbitrary detention in the uh, Anti-Terror Act? Yes. Uh, that was actually assigned to Congressman Lagman, but Section 29 is on uh, uh, arrest and prolonged detention, Your okay. Honor. Okay. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with that, and I, I just want to ask you about that. Uh, what does that section actually do? Well, uh, upon the authorization. It suspends Article 125, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Not suspend, but it redefines arbitrary detention for purposes of terrorism, correct? Correct, Your or Honor. Or acts considered as terrorism. Is that not correct? Correct. And not only that, we, we argue also that, that the Constitution is also transgressed. Okay, what part of the Constitution? Well, uh, in our opinion, Your Honor, the Constitution limits the days of detention for a prisoner, Your Honor, and that is our contention. And that particular provision we would like to forward. So this is Article, was actually Article written, 7, yes, Section sir. 18, Your Honor. 18. What, so, what again is Article 17, Section 18? Well, it says, Your Honor, that. It's uh, called the Commander in Chief provision. Yes, correct? Your Honor. Okay, in now, cases of. Uh, a while ago, we, we clarified that there were two approaches to attending to terrorism. The first approach is the executive approach which is to treat it as an, a threat against international peace, a threat against national security. And therefore, like in Section 2, there is a cutout there. And the cutout is about executive actions to address terrorism. Like, for yes, example, Honor. what happened in Marawi. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. So it is calling out the armed forces to address an invasion or rebellion or simply uh, the calling out power. Uh, of, the, uh, of the president to call out the armed forces to suppress lawless violence. That's all, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And I recall that uh, there was somebody among us who dissented and said that's not rebellion, that is terrorism. Is that not right? I, I'm not familiar, Your Honor. You're not familiar? Yes. You're talking to him, right? Oh, the, yes. yes, Your okay. Honor. But in any case, so what we are saying is, yes, so that is one uh, provision. Article... A, Section 18, is the Commander-in-Chief provision, correct? Yes, Your Honor. It prohibits and suspends the writ of habeas. It allows the President to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. And to suspend the writ of habeas corpus during its suspension, a person may not be detained for more than three days, correct? Correct, Your Honor. So the link there is the three days is connected to habeas corpus, correct? Well, in my opinion, Your Honor, it is actually connected uh, with the to, provision to all, Your Honor, because if it is an extreme situation where the writ of habeas corpus is, uh, is has been imposed and it limits only to three days, the more reason, Your Honor, we argue, okay. of course, that it will also apply if uh, a person in, is in normal times, Your Honor, because of the provision now in the Anti-Terror Act 
is habeas corpus still applicable to them? Well, they, they can uh, resort to that. Because all uh, it does, it says that the rule on arbitrary detention will not apply because the days now will be different, correct? Your, your Honor, if the And habeas therefore, is habeas corpus still viable when somebody is detained under the Anti-Terror Act? I think it can be argued by the uh, accused, yes. Your Honor, in this case, that uh, since Section 29, the title itself says, uh, detention without judicial warrant and the authorization of the ATC was empowered by the law, Therefore, the uh, detention so when of the, the ATC, person is valid because of uses the uses a justification which is not allowed by the law, and uses, for example, no designation yet, arrests an individual, and keeps that individual for more than 10 days, for, for that matter. Habeas corpus is no longer available. They can, of course, the, uh, so the is there uh, anything, accused your honor can file a habeas corpus petition, yes. is but there because anything the, in law the law allows the ATC. Yes. to do that, Your Honor, then the habeas corpus could be dismissed immediately yes, by the you judge. Know, you know, Attorney Neri, you are convincing me, correct? Thank you. And if you do not I listen so, to my... Your Honor. You are not listening to my questions. I will not be able to understand from, 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 from my perspective. But Your Honor, I was answering your previous question. Yeah, I got your answer yes, in the first yes. words that you said, and that's yes, my your preference, Honor. correct? Yes. Submit, Your okay. Honor. Now, uh, so you are saying that habeas corpus is not available if a person is already detained under this law. Is that your contention? The uh, person can still file a habeas corpus petition, okay. but so it cannot be that even... that right a... is not removed, correct? Pardon, Your Honor. That right is not removed. Well, the, the filing itself, Your Honor, but the effectiveness of the remedy is already removed because the, well, the fair council... When you file a petition for habeas corpus, you file it before a court of law, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And the court of law can be the Supreme Court, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And you are telling us that when they file a petition for habeas corpus here, we will certainly dismiss it. Well, Your, Your Honor, You because... know better than Manila Times, the result of the action of the court? You <laughs> know better than, than us? Yeah, Your Honor, please. Yes. The, so we can clarify uh, the title even. of the law, Your Honor, is detention without judicial warrant. So the court will say, well, that was valid under the law. Yes. That but you can be detained again, for as 24 said, days without judicial warrant. That is so your, what's, what's that's your, your interpretation, question? and you do not sit in the bench, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, and uh, part of the way that we can clarify is it's possible to file a petition for habeas yes, corpus. Your Honor. Yes. And when a petition is filed, it is up to the court to attend at that moment to see whether the three days or the 14 days will apply, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, and uh, proceeding from a theme that I had last, last time, we wait for that incident, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Have you been detained already by this law? Not yet, Your Not Honor. Not yet. Has, have any of your clients been detained under this law? Many, Your Honor. Your been... petition. In my petition, yes. not, not that I know of, okay. no, but me, Your Honor, Thank please. you for the clarification. Your Honor, please, if I may, the law includes the exercise of civil and political rights within the ambit of terrorism, Your Honor. Wait, that's not and my question. I already, I will ask that from Attorney Chell. Oh, so okay. let me just uh, go to the question. Thank you, uh, Just Honor. for brevity and for orderly procedure, um, so that, my, that the rest you, of my Honor. colleagues can ask the question now, and we might be able to finish today. Thank and you. then uh, maybe... Uh, tonight we will hear the Solgen, and I'm not. I, I think we will have another session for that. Okay, but that that nonetheless. Okay, now you spoke about surveillance, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Okay. There is section two and there is section three of Article three of the Constitution. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. What is the difference between se section two and section three in terms of its application of the Constitution? Well, our, uh, Section 2, Your Honor, is uh, about the right of the people to be secure in their persons. The right persons. of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures yes. and shall be inviolable. And you look at, look at the end phrase, describing the place to be searched and the correct. persons or things to be seized, correct? Yes, Your Honor. So the person or thing already exists to be seized. Yes, Your Honor. And the person or thing to be seized person or thing, and thing can be fungible or non-fungible, correct? Tangible or intangible. They already exist, correct? Yes, Your Honor. In other words, Section 2 might apply, re just reading that, might apply when the crime has already been committed, right? Or about to be committed, Your Honor. No, it says persons or things to be seized. Therefore, yes, it is already there, right? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Now, look at Section 3. 
Section 3 actually says, the privacy of communication and correspondence shall be inviolable except upon lawful order of the court or when public safety or order requires otherwise as prescribed by law. Now, the difference might be, and this is covered in a separate opinion in the case of Subido versus AMLA, the law firm of, uh, I think, then uh, Vice President Dinay versus AMLA. Uh, the ponente there was uh, Pepe Perez, uh, Justice Pepe Perez, and there was a separate opinion which clarified that Article 3, Section 3 applies to conversations and communication. And the intervention there happens before you speak. And therefore, the thing does not yet exist, correct? Well, Your Honor, under the surveillance. ACA law, surveillance, yes. Your Honor, No, we're just going to Section 3. Section 3. I'm okay. not yet in AMLA. Okay. Section 3 says, privacy of communication and correspondence shall not be violated. Can we go back to Section 3? Yes, Except upon lawful order of the court, correct? Correct, Your Honor. It, it means, therefore, that the, uh, there is a law which allows that the communication can be intercepted, privacy yes. of communication except upon lawful order of the yes. court, right? In order to be able to get conversation which has not yet happened. For example, uh, Attorney Neri, uh, you are in my contact list and you are being surveilled. Yes. We haven't spoken yet, but when I call you and ask you, magkano ba ang kalinga kape coffee mo? That will be what will be intercepted, but the authority of the court comes before the thing exists, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. And look at the test in Section 3. Does it say probable cause? No, Your Honor. It says lawful order of the court. Yes, Your When Honor. public safety or order requires otherwise, public safety or order requires otherwise, as prescribed by law. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. That's the provision, Your So Honor. this is not Section 2, correct? Yes, Your Honor. So surveillance can be allowed so long as there is a law and the law is based upon public safety or order, correct? But we contain, Your Honor, that surveillance is search, Your Honor, under the Constitution too. No, again, look at Section 3. Yes, Your Honor. And you said the difference is in searches, the thing already exists. The conversation is already there. That may be applicable for text messages already exchanged. But for surveillance... Papanoorin nila kung saan ka pupunta. Susundang ka nila. Hindi mo pa nagagawa. And the lawful order there comes out before you actually do it. Before the thing will exist. And all it says is lawful order of the court, yes, number sir. one. Public safety or order requires and this is in the law, correct? Yes, Your Honor. So the, this is met the, by the, the Anti-Terror Act. Your Honor, in this case is that we contest the intrinsic validity of, of the Section 4, Your Honor, because it is vague, it is overbroad, and therefore any uh, resulting lawful order from the court has violated the uh, fundamental rights of the um, suspect. Your I cannot Honor. get the idea that it is vague because lawful order, so the uh, Court of Appeals will issue the order. The law already states that they can issue the, the order, and therefore the surveillance constitutionally under Section 3, Paragraph 1, is valid, correct? Yes, Your Honor. I'm yes. referring to the definition of terrorism under Section 4. And second to that, Your Honor, the surveillance uh, section under Section yes. 16 does not only give... Uh, In other words, Attorney Neri, I would like you to cover this distinction. That there are searches that are for purposes of getting the fruit of the crime. Yes, Your Honor. And this is already not investigation for purposes of defining whether a person has committed the offense. This is already to gather the evidence for prosecution, period. Yes, Your Honor. There is investigation that is criminal in nature, where you are trying to determine whether this person is actually a criminal. That's where surveillance can come in, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, and there is this situation for terrorism, when apart from the fact that you want to put it within the rubric of prosecution of crimes, criminal investigation, preliminary investigation, conviction, you also want to stop it. And therefore, you want law enforcers to be able to look at a suspect and be able to find out whether they are in fact planning to put a bomb inside the television, put it in a super ferry, in order that it will kill 116 individuals. Is that not correct? Yes. So but your honors... You have to, uh, maybe in your memorandum, make this distinction, and I hope this whole gen also can uh, address this, that there are certain instances where the intrusion is not to get the fruit of the evidence, 
but the intrusion is to prevent terrorism as a unique crime of the 21st century. As Correct? long as it's not tantamount to fishing expeditions, Your Honor, and recognize the right to privacy we contend, then that may be allowed, Your Honor. But, but there is a the certain case... degree of, uh, shall we say, um, there's a certain degree of risk always when you are trying to find out whether an individual, based upon your knowledge, might be a terrorist, correct? But no unbridled uh, discretion on the part of the of enforcement can be of given by the court. That and is the basic case, uh, framework of our constitution. There can be no unbridled license. But yes. would it be enough in order to stop somebody from even planting a bomb inside the television and putting it in a super ferry so that it kills 116 individuals. You agree with me? I'm sure current that lawyer it is legitimate, will address that, That it's Honor. a legitimate public function. Don't debate with me, counsel. Answer my questions. Sorry. Let me finish my questions. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. So, in other words, it is legitimate for, the public, uh, for a public agency to be able to prevent even the putting of a bomb inside the television at that early stage, in yes, order Honor. that there is no danger to anyone, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, again, uh, please cover that in your Thank you. uh, memorandum. It was you that said last meeting that the old law was already had all the tools yes, in order to interdict terrorism. Yes, Your Honor. And what's your study? Well, it, it might, it, our contention, Your Honor, there are current laws. The revised penal code panel says... No, I mean, on. how do you know that the laws already contained all the tools in order for a law enforcer to interdict terrorism. Have you done that? Your Honor, I don't have to experience, or none of us have to experience no being experience. law enforcers. So Your therefore, Honor's it is only if, if based may, on your belief. Finish, Your Honor. You said no experience. No. So therefore, it is only based on your belief, correct? Your Honor, in the same way that it this court will decide... It is based upon your opinion. No, Your Honor, please, if I may finish. Yes. In the same way that this court may not be priests or pastors, but they can decide on whether the practice of religious profession is, uh, is a transgress, Your Honor. That's why we you have... don't have to be a part of the media to rule on free press. So I find it, Your Honor, uh, I, I don't think it's uh, In other words, you necessary have never for been, me to be a law enforcer. To you have know. never been a law enforcer. No, Your correct? Honor. You have never gone after a terrorist. Is that not correct? No, no, Your you Honor. cannot even enumerate to me the high-value targets now under the National Security Agency. No, Your Honor. You cannot enumerate to me. You cannot know what happened in all of these incidents, why intelligence failed or law enforcers failed. No, Your Honor. Yes. But we all Yet you say that they already had all the tools, correct? Yes, Your Honor. So you want us to go beyond the wisdom of those that proposed the law, the wisdom of the House, all 300 of them, the wisdom of the 24 senators with some dissents, in order to be able to say, hey, we already know that the old law was better, correct? It is possible, Your Honor, that they will have or do not have the tools. But the issue in this court is not whether they have or do not have the tools. Because even if they do not have the to tools, the court cannot allow a law that to give have, them tools and violate constitutional that rights. That they have the honor. tools or did not have the tools is your opinion, correct? It's my opinion, Your yes. Honor. And your opinion is just an opinion. Yes, but that's not so the issue. In, in epistemology, case, it is a belief. It yes, may not Your be honor. a true belief. It may not be a justified true belief, correct? Yes, Your it, Honor. So you are just alleging. Right? Yes, but they right. also contain your honor that they don't have the tools. So you're on the same well, I'm footing. sorry, uh, Attorney Neri. Yes, we honor. have to give them their opportunity to be heard. Okay, thank and you. And we honor. will want to hear from them also. So you cannot pass on your answers to me by yes, pointing to a straw person. Correct? I'm just saying that we contend. That, that's a logical fallacy, right? Well, yes. we contend your honor. Thank you, in Attorney Neri. Can I now ask uh, Attorney uh, Chell? Thank you, Your Honor. Can I just go with you through some basics in freedom of expression? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Because you did mention uh, content-based and strict scrutiny yes, sir. during your opening remarks. And I just want to clarify whether we mean we are on the same page on that, uh, Attorney Chell. So uh, there is a range of act and opinion, act, and conduct. Is that not correct? That's yes, a range. Sir. Yes. And uh, uh, speech and conduct are regulated differently, correct? 
Except for symbolic uh, conduct that is yes. symbolic speech. Yes, yes. yes. just the general field general. first. Primitius versus Fogoso, you remember that. Reyes versus Bagatsin. Time, place, and manner, where it does not affect speech or uh, does not look at speech, but simply regulates the roads. That's a prime example of regulation of conduct, not speech, correct? And with respect to speech, you agree with the statement of Attorney <laughs> Latif that violence can never be expressive speech. Violent um, advocacy of imminent no, lawless not advocacy. action. Your violence own. itself. Ah, violence itself. Violence itself is unprotected speech because it can be expressive. Correct? Yes, sir. So uh, uh, expression is different from uh, act. Act can be expressive, and with respect to acts. It must be that uh, it is there. Now, uh, what, we, what the Terrorism Act now does is look at speech, correct? In terms of Section 9 at the very least, correct? Let's just focus on Section 9. Yes, sir. Inciting, correct? Okay. And when it looks at speech, there are two ways. One is to test speech from the point of view of whether the law invites examination of its content in order to outlaw it, or the other one, whether it invites to look at the content, but it is content neutral. Is that not correct? Yes, you are. Yes, and content-based speech is the penalty or the, uh, the correction comes because of the content of the speech, correct? Exactly. Right. Yes, and with respect to content neutral, it is not the content of the speech, but its effects. Correct? The restriction on speech is incidental if yes. it is content so, neutral. Um, I guess you will cover this more in your memoranda because the, there is a thin line that divides content-based and content-neutral. But let me concede with you. If it is content-based speech, okay, we go to that. Advocacy of a violent act, is that constitutionally protected? If it, yes, Your Honor. Under the doctrine of Brandenburg, if it is advocacy yes. of violence that is imminent lawless action and likely to yes. cause, then that is not protected. But otherwise, it is still protected by speech, Your Honor. Yes. Um, I am allergic to quoting an American case because of the Philippine flag yes, that flies I'm there. I'm very sorry, Your Honor. May but I it is covered that, uh, by Iglesia ni Cristo. MVRS and case, later, Iglesia, and your opponent, your separate in opinion in, um, I think, uh, Nicholas Lewis, Your Honor. No, and Diocese versus Bacolod yes. also uh, called attention to the incitement test in Brandenburg. Okay, let's go to Brandenburg. In Brandenburg, it clearly said, again, admitted into our jurisprudence via the cases that you mentioned, okay, that advocacy of violence is constitutionally protected, correct? But there is an exception, and there are three elements in the exception. If it is directed to inciting or producing, that's one. Second, imminent lawless action. And third, is likely to incite or produce such action, correct? That is correct, yes. Your Honor. And Section 9 can be read as containing all of this by the word incitement. Well, Section 9 does not include those three exceptions, if Your Honor, please. But that's the court why can the say, implementing rules yes. attempted to supply. Yes, that. but Attorney Chell, you will agree with me that when Brandenburg was ruled in the United States, this was not in the law. This was jurisprudence, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. And uh, it's very close to what Learned Hand was uh, kept on saying in masses publishing, correct? And finally, it got to the Supreme Court because it was a friend of Learned Hand that actually produced this kind of a decision, correct? So this was not in the law. But the Supreme Court said, whenever there is advocacy that is protected, but when the advocacy shifts to incitement, this is how it is, correct? Yes, Your Honor. As a matter of fact, the concept of incitement is also internationally recognized, right? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. There is a Security Council Resolution 1624, which calls upon all the states, all states in the United Nations, to punish incitement to terrorism, correct? Yes, Your Honor. At whatever stage it is. This is 1624 of 2005. And uh, that is the actual perambular clause, correct? Yes, yes. Your Honor. So uh, under Section 9, we can read it as meaning all of that, correct? Saving Section 9. If it is read in that way, Your Honor, perhaps, yes. Okay, so we're done with your case. Uh, no, Your Honor, yeah, please. Okay, the other, the other point. Section 9 applies only to certain individuals, correct? There is a qualifier. The qualifier there is without taking any direct part. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. 
taking a direct part in acts of terrorism will be punished differently from incitement, correct? It I'm will sorry. be punished by Section 4, Section 5, threats, Section 6, proposal, Section 7, conspiracy, correct? So Section 9 only applies to you and me that may not be a participant in the acts of terrorism, correct? Yes. Yes, and what you are after is the very broad definition of how the second the, the qualifier in section four has been formulated is that not correct that is another point your honor if i okay. may your honor go back to your honor's point that uh, we have no more case we submit that uh, that kind of interpretation would cross the boundary to judicial legislation well it is uh, freedom of expression and freedom of expression is a broad vague general term in the constitution and given the times a contemporary court may interpret it but let me go to my other point have you looked at the implementing rules and regulations? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, 4.5, last paragraph. Have you seen that? I believe so, Your Honor. Yes. And in 4.5, last paragraph, what is the essence of that proviso? I believe Your Honor is referring to that provision that says that uh, if the exercise of civil and political rights is, has the requisite intent and purpose, then it may still be give rise to prosecution and liability for terrorism. So 4.5 actually punishes advocacy simply, not incitement. Correct? Yes, Your Honor. Um, let's look at 4.5, last paragraph of uh, 4.5. If any of the acts enumerated in paragraph A to G, however, are intended to cause death, this is advocacy, then it is punishable as a crime, correct? That would appear to be yes. It. This is the interpretation in the implementing rules, correct? Yes, sir. And if we strike this down, this implementing rule, this portion only, and go back to the qualifier, which actually says advocacy is exempted, then that would be all right. Well, th there is an inherent flaw in the proviso of Section 4, if I may be allowed to explain, Your Honor, please. Because the exercise of civil and political rights, I think we will all agree, is protected by the Constitution so long as it is peaceful Regardless of intent, I may go out and protest and join an, an assembly, even if my intent is to be violent, as long as my intent does not cross the line I into I action. I understand your point. That is still protected, Your Honor. But let us look at Section 4. Section 4, the last paragraph. These are qualifiers to A, B, C, and A, B, C, D, E. Would you agree with me that A, B, C, D, and E are the criminal acts? Yes, Your Honor. And the qualifiers are the exempting circumstances, so to speak. Well, may I qualify my previous answer? A, B, D, and E are obviously criminal acts. Yes. A, B, and C are acts, but they are not criminal acts as yes. required by the UN resolution and They're not criminal acts because it's other. now provided in the law and punished. Actus non facit reum nisi mens nula poena sine lehe. Now it is punished, therefore it's now a crime, correct? So but, again, this last paragraph seems to be a circumstance that looks at la like an exempting circumstance in the revised penal code, correct? I'm not sure I would classify it as okay. such, Your Honor. I will leave that at that, and I'm sure, again, my colleagues who are more expert uh, on justifying and exempting circumstances will follow that through, uh, uh, follow that through when we uh, finish. Um, may, may I just point out, if Your Honor, please, that unlike the United Nations definition of terrorism, which requires criminal acts, um, the, our law, ABC, I'm referring to 4ABC, took out the word criminal and no, but, simply uh, requires acts. Security resolution, uh, security council resolution, 1566. Yes, Your Honor, even okay. that. States that criminal acts. And the United Nations did not prescribe what the criminal acts are. It is up to the domestic jurisdiction to define what they think are criminal acts. Yes, Your Honor, but yes. criminal acts are different from acts intended to. If I, yeah, but the, if that is the definition in our law, then that becomes the criminal act, correct? The, it's still, the definition still does not require a criminal yes, act again, under our uh, statute. Maybe Your just explain in your memoranda, but uh, criminal acts in 1566 clearly state, uh, uh, does not state what kind of criminal acts must be criminalized by the state. It is up to the state to be able to ask that. Uh, well, finally, can I ask uh, Attorney Molo, uh, Professor Molo? Thank you, yeah. uh, Attorney Thank you, Chair. Um, Professor Molo. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Yes. Um, 
when did uh, Justice Carpio stop advocating about the South, the West Philippine Sea? Did you say stop, Your Honor? Sorry. Yes, stop. Stop. He didn't stop. He, he did still not stop. Uh, I thought that he was so afraid that he already stopped. Uh, no. No, he, he did not stop. Sir. In fact, he went up it. There was another column that I saw, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And in fact, uh, if I know Justice Carpio correctly, and I think many of our colleagues know that, he is not afraid of even facing the one million People's Liberation Army of China when he speaks about the West Philippine Sea. Is that not correct? Yes, Your okay. Honor. The when did the professor, Dr. J. Batumbakal, stop teaching? He is not stopping teaching, Your Honor. In fact, he even went to the front lines in the UPDND Accord uh, rally. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. And therefore, uh, he was not actually chilled or feared. He is not afraid. Correct? Uh, well, may I disagree, Your Honor? What about me? Professor Theodore Te, also your client, right? Yes, Your Honor. Did he stop talking about criticisms about this government because uh, no, of Honor. the anti-terror law? Uh, no one can stop he did Professor not. Te. No. Yes. Uh, he keeps on speaking, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Through I can media, that. he writes also in, I don't know, Rappler or Inquirer. I'm not sure now, right? Yes, what Your Honor. What about uh, a, a Professor... Charlemagne Yu. This is Charlie Yu, correct? Yes, Your Our Honor. Our friend, Charlie Yu. Yes, he Honor. also stopped speaking and criticizing government. Is that not correct? Um, he still continues. Because he uh, was chilled, correct? Oh. No. He still speaks, right? He still speaks, Your what Honor. What about the, your, the student that ran understand in UP? Understand UP, Your Honor. Is he now cowering in fear inside their homes? Well, sometimes, Your Honor, because uh, oh, of really? the recent... But the, he still goes out when he needs to, Your Honor. Uh, only because of COVID, of course. But for uh, fear of speaking Because of the recent out, incident about the UP Yeah, hotbed, but in any case, the point there is, um, dissent, inherent in dissent is discomfort. Is that not true? That is true, Your Honor. Because in terms of dissent, you speak against a majority or a status quo. Is that not true? Yes, Your Honor. And there is always discomfort in dissent, Correct. Yes, Your Honor. But the, the discomfort in the dissent does not always justify the content of the dissent, correct? Yes, Who Your knows Honor. that the majority might be right and your point of view might be wrong as of the prop, proper moment. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. In fact, in UP, your clients, the University of the Philippines College of Law Professors, the listing of your clients, Yes, Your Honor. It valorizes courage. Is that not true? Yes, Your Honor. It's part of the motto. Hindi lang tapang kundi giting at tapang, two kinds of courage. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. And therefore, the more that you hit them, the more that you scare them, the more that they will come out. Correct? Yes, Your Honor. So they are not chilled? They are chilled, Your Honor. They are chilled? Yes, Your Honor. So you mean to say uh, Justice Antonio Carpio is cowering in fear? Not right now, Your Honor. Not right now, okay. But Again, within the concept of... Chilled, Professor Molo... Uh, sorry, Your Honor. Perhaps you can cover this. This is my point. Oh, yes, Your Honor. Chilling effect is very subjective. And in terms of your clients, I do not refer to the other petitions, but in terms of your clients, I know them to be professors of the UP College of Law, correct? Great. Yes, Your Honor. And uh, professors of the uh, uh, products of the UP College of Law, like you, are trained not to fear anything, correct? Except because you stand, you stand for somebody, correct? Yes, Your Honor. As a matter of fact, do you know that during the EDSA revolt in EDSA, there was a moment where the president declared curfew. You know what happened? I, I, uh, there were more people that young. went there. I was there, right? Okay, yes, sir. Where were you during EDSA? Never mind, don't uh, answer me. Okay, but the EDSA point there is they went out. When the ATA law was passed, what happened in UP? Your Honor, there was some form of uh, protest, Your Honor. Not some form. It was one of the biggest protests since the pandemic uh, caused the lockdown. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. So in other words, isn't chilling effect also a matter of fact? No, Your Honor. We, Why? Your Honor, chilling effect within the concept of constitutional law does not refer to an absolutely chilled population. It refers to that pause in the writer as he composes his words it is the hesitation inside the mind of the speaker because of a vague and overbroad law he doesn't know whether the next word that he will say will be criminal or in this case mark him as a terrorist justice carp is not afraid that is true he will never be afraid i concede that your honor 
But it would be another thing to suggest that there is no pause, there's no hesitation. In fact, Your Honor, if I may, because... Uh, uh, this counsel, is, perhaps sorry, you can just cover that in your memoranda, but as yes, far as I am getting you, he is not afraid, but he is chilled. Yes, Your So Honor. to me, that, that doesn't seem uh, logical, but I am sure that you will find a way to explain that in your memoranda. But I think I made my point. Yes, and Your for Honor. the other counsels, perhaps, to cover that if they feel like covering that in their memoranda. I yes, am Your done, Honor. Chief. I yield. Thank you, Your uh, Honor. Justice Alex, you're next. Okay. Thank Go you, ahead. Chief. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Can Attorney Jokna yield a few questions from the court? Attorney Jokna, do you have a, a copy with you of your opening statement? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Attorney Jokno, would you agree to the proposition that the anti-terrorism law was enacted by the legislature in the exercise of police power? Yes, Your Honor. Absolutely, right? When Congress decided to legislate the new anti-terrorism law, is it not a fact that the situation has changed from the previous events consist, uh, consisting of terrorist acts? That is the justification for the new law. Okay. Is there a universal definition for the crime of terrorism? There is none. There can, uh, the member okay. states of the United Nations have not been able to agree on one, Your Honor. What, what could be the reason why there can be no uniform or standard definition of terrorism? Well, I think it's, Your Honor, please, it, it is a question of how to identify the essential elements that would comprise the crime. What, what there is agreement on is that there must be a criminal act or a predicate crime. And, is it, um, is it that because terrorism continuously evolved as a crime? Well, while Terrorism it, years ago may be consisting of an, an actual armed conflict, right? It may have, yes, Your Honor. That but may, over the years, terrorism may come in the form of cyber attack. Yes, Your Honor. So in other words, the situation is that terrorism cannot be strictly defined in a specific way. Technically, what we have now is a description of acts, correct? That would constitute terrorism. Is that not the case? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Now, you said, uh, if I, correct, I heard you correctly last uh, oral argument, is that the present law on terrorism is void for vagueness, correct? That is one of our arguments. Okay. Our main argument is that it, it, is, it regulates speech, therefore yes. it restricts who okay. the should be applied, and it fails the strict it's, scrutiny test. It's in yeah. your clustering of, uh, in your manifestation. Yes, anyway. Your Honor. And that uh, you consider the old... Human Security Act as sufficient for purposes of penalizing terrorism. Is that correct? But we did not make any such allegation in our petition. If you're but I case. heard you said that, you know, the old law, Human Security Act, is better because it enumerates the specific, what you might call it, uh, predicate offenses. Is that not correct? You said that. We, yes, Your Honor, that the old law, the Human Security Act, is more consistent with the international requirements for terrorism because okay. it requires a criminal act or a predicate crime. Thank you. In your opening statement at page 2, it says that the ATA offers a, a smorgasbord of acts, intents and purposes. At the last paragraph of page 2 in your opening statement, do you see that? Yes, Your Honor. But what makes the law unpalatable is the fact that it dispenses with the requirement of a predicate crime. So in your point of view, you would rather have the a la carte listing of predicate offense as provided in the Human Security Act. Is that what you're trying to tell us? Not exactly, Your Honor. What we are saying only is that the, if a new law will be passed, it should at least require 
the commission of a criminal act rather than the term acts intended to. Okay. And you, con you continue saying that which appears to be the norm among nations. Is that the case? Yes, Your Honor. And then you cited the directive of EU 2017-541. Is that correct? That is one of the authorities we cited, okay. Your Honor. Now, since there is no universal definition of terrorism, and you claim that our definition of terrorism under Section 4 would be unconstitutional based on its text as it is written right now. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Let me show you the terrorism law as provided in the European Convention or the European Union, specifically 201 Seven five four one. Okay. Can you take a look at the terrorism in the European Union based on this uh, directive two zero one seven five four one? Yes, Your Honor. You've uh, seen that, right? Yes, Your Honor. Now, the text mentions also nature and purpose. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Okay. In fact, when you read the provisions of that European Union definition of terrorism, and you compare it with our own provisions under the new ATA, isn't it that there is some kind of uniformity? Not exactly, Your Honor. The yeah, not exactly but major provisions are the same. I think one major difference, if I may, Your Honor, is the fact that it, the, our law does not require the commission of criminal acts or a predicate crime. Yeah, but if you look at the, you look at the statement of the, or the provisions in Article 3, it says member states shall take the necessary measures to ensure that the following intentional acts as defined as offenses under national law, which give the nature, given their natural context and context, context may seriously damage a country or international organization are defined as terrorist offenses. And you look at the enumeration, starting with paragraph 2A and down up to the last paragraphs. Isn't that the basic, the same provisions in our present terrorism law? I'm sorry, Your Honor, I cannot agree because the EU directive refers to intentional acts and then specifies them or enumerates them by referring to actual actions that um, attacks on a person's life, attacks on physical yeah. integrity, which are all criminal acts, if Your Honor, please. But exactly, you look at our, can you uh, please post section four of the anti-terrorism law as, we, as it is presently written. Section four. There you go. Engage in acts intended. Yes, Your Engage Honor. Engage in acts intended. Therefore, Perhaps the only difference is the way by which our law is written vis-a-vis -vis the way it was written in the context of a common law tradition vis-a-vis -vis our civil law tradition. Because if you look at it, manufacture, possession, acquisition, transport, supply, explosive, practically enumerating the same acts as what is provided in Section 4. I would say, Your Honor, that Sections 4D and 4E refer yes. to actual criminal acts. The only difference is Paragraph C in the European Union is very specific. It mentions kidnapping or hostage taking, which is not present in our present anti-terrorism act. But in our definition in Section 4, if Your Honor, please, I'm referring to A, B, and C. They refer to acts intended to cause destruction, death, etc., which but, which may which cover even non-criminal acts. It's the intent that is operative there, Your Honor. That is, if you interpret Section Four in isolation or in truncated portions, 
But if you read Section 4 in its entirety, you will be able to see that those enumerations A, B, C, and D, and E relates to the succeeding enumerations of those offenses that are considered in relation to A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, and E. Is that not correct? I, I'm sorry, I cannot agree, if Your Honor, please. I believe that each of these uh, subsections is um, one way of meeting the first element. The, the law seems to define terrorism as having two elements. First are acts, either yes. A, B, C, D, and uh, can you Second please, uh, is purpose. Can you uh, post that uh, Exhibit C of Attorney Jokno? Attorney Jokno, I will invoke the Perius rule because I copied your slide presentation. <laughs> no problem. Is that okay with you? Of course, Your Honor. You see, it, from your point of view, terrorism under Section 4 would only be consisting of two elements. Is that not correct? Based that on is, your slide. That is our, my understanding. Of That's your understanding. Yeah. So you have first essential element, second essential element. But if you read the provision of Section 4, that doesn't end on those two, essential, uh, two basic elements. Because if you look at the uh, later paragraphs of Section 4, it says there, when the purpose of such acts by its nature and context. Do you see that? Yes, Your Honor. You cannot isolate the enumerations above in relation to that statement when the purpose of such act by the nature and content. So in other words, to be able to understand what the context of terrorism under Section 4 is, is you read, read the entire law. Yes, Your Honor, and we have. So, in other we, words, we do read both elements. Your presentation to that, as far as Section Four uh, defining terrorism, would only have two elements, would perhaps I would call inaccurate, because in reality, can you uh, please post? In reality, the, the, please go back to this. In reality, the elements of terrorism would be like this, taking into account the specific provision of law, the acts engages in and the purpose, but in between, it says there, you have to consider the nature and the context. So you may say that an act enumerated in A, B, C, D may not be criminal per se, right? And yet, when you relate it to the succeeding provisions of the law, you see the context on how the law should be applied. That will constitute the offense of terrorism. Is that not correct? It is our position, Your Honor, that uh, even as shown on the screen, the law essentially is combined, composed of two elements. When you speak of nature and context, that refers to how to determine the second element, the purpose. When yes. the purpose of such act by, it, by its nature and context. Therefore, our, our, our position, if Your Honor, please, is that the law really does um, require two essential elements, which but should be both read with each but other. But if you read also the European definition of terrorism, it also speaks given the nature or context. We have no problem with that uh, part Exactly, of the European but, but you're having problems as far as the, our definition in Section 4 when you're dealing with nature and context. As I said in our opening statement, our issue, if you're on a crisis, so, with the dispensing so let of me the modify your, crime. Let me modify your two elements of terrorism under Section 4. Is it not the the presentation of definition of uh, terrorism under Section 4 should appear like that. The act, the purpose, the nature and context equals terrorism. I, I'm sorry, I would have to disagree, Your Honor. The act and purpose would constitute terrorism. In determining the purpose, one must consider the nature and the context. So yeah, the nature and context are simply factors to be considered yeah, in arriving okay. at the conclusion. Precisely, you're saying that there are only two elements, the act and the purpose. And to, to you, that's the elements. But when you read the entire section four, you cannot discount the purpose being taken into account and what context the acts enumerated in A, B, C, D, E were committed by the person. Yes, Your Honor, we cannot discount the context. Sir, you cannot discount that to have an understanding what is punishable under Section 4. Yes, Your Honor. Exactly. Now, 
He also said that it is only in this anti-terrorism law that constitutionally guaranteed rights, political and civil rights, are conflicted in the sense that they are included in the definition of the law. Is that not what you said? Yes, Your Honor. But if you read the, the law, the proviso says, can you flash back section four? There is a qualifier. In fact, our terrorism law, if you look at section four, is a lot better than the US, I mean, the EU terrorism law, because here there is a black and white <coughs> statement expressly expressly stated in the law that those political and or constitutionally guaranteed rights are excluded as a rule, right? She says there, it becomes only, a, a, it will form part of terrorism if those constitutionally enumerated uh, political rights will cause what? The last part. And is not intended to cause death or serious physical harm to a person, right? The problem, so there is an exclusionary provision. The problem, Your Honor, with that proviso is that it, it includes protected speech and conduct. If I may have a minute to explain, if Your Honor, please. Um, I think it's, we will all agree that any exercise of civil and political rights, as long as it is peaceful, is protected, regardless of what is in the mind of Correct. the Agreed. protester. So if I were to participate in a peaceful assembly, even if my intent is violent, as long as my intent does not cross the line Precisely, into violence, then that is protected. For purposes However, of intent, it's required in criminal law that there be a what? I'm sorry, Your Honor. For purposes, for purposes of, of criminal law prosecution. Well, because you cannot penalize intent for how, no matter how criminal your intent is, intent is, you cannot be prosecuted, right? Generally, intent may only be inferred from a criminal act, and our problem yes, with the there law must is be that what it an external action that what that should manifest that what you're doing transgresses the provision of the law. Is a that criminal that correct? act, Your Honor? Yes. Okay. Now, you also said that in your exhibit D, this plus exhibit uh, exhibit D. I don't know where you got this, but apparently this is a what, a flyer or a post in a website? Exhibit D? That was uh, taken from the website of the PNP Batak okay. station, if I'm not mistaken. And in your yes. opening statement at paragraph three, it says here, this Exhibit C, right? Anyone, therefore, who tweets for people to attend a peaceful rally could be arrested for engaging in acts intended to endanger person's life due to the danger of COVID infection, Exhibit C. Can you point to me which part of Exhibit C that would penalize a person based on that announcement? May I approach the slide? I cannot sure. read it from here. If not. I'm sorry, I reduced your presentation. Where is that? Which part? that based on that posting, it provides a warning that you can be prosecuted under anti-terrorism law because you would cause or cause or endanger person's life due to the danger of COVID infection. It is in the middle portion, if you're on a please on the right side of the And slide, what does it say? Participating in a rally or any movement that can cause a serious risk to public safety. Is that your basis? We're, we included this exhibit simply to show that that is how one police station is interpreting the anti-terror law. Yeah, but Your Honor, that, that, that uh, post simply tells you what the law says, right? No, I would have to disagree with that, Your Honor. Why? Does it say that you can be arrested for violation of Section 4 because you may cause the spread of COVID? Well, the caption, basis, Your Honor... On the basis of that? The caption, Your Honor, is who is a terrorist? And it is answered by participating in a rally or other, other uh, move, any movement that can cause a serious risk to public safety. And I don't believe that that is the intent of the anti-terror law, Your Honor, please. Because yes, that would now intrude into the exercise of civil and political rights that is protected by the Constitution. 
Yeah, but you said it will endanger person's life due to the danger of COVID infection. Yes, Your Honor. It says here that can cause a serious risk to public safety. By people gathering in a public place, it could easily be said by law enforcers Are that... Are you sure that that, that, it, that, that, that the portion refers to public safety? Well, it, because it, you mentioned yet endanger person's life due to the danger of COVID infection. Is that an issue of public safety? It is an issue of public safety, Your Honor. Um, Are you sure? That is our, my understanding, if you're honest, please. Because if you look at the Constitution, okay, public safety and public health are two distinct constitutional concepts. Is that not the case? I believe that the issues of public health may endanger public safety as well, Your Honor. No, because the Constitution is very clear. There is a distinction between public health or public safety. And the only reference to that is in Section 6 of Article uh, 3. See? The right to travel shall not be impaired except in the interest of national security, public safety, or public health as may be provided by law. While it is true, Your Honor, that Section 6 differentiates between the two, I oh. do not believe that that um, fine distinction would be understood by law enforcers. So you're presuming that an ordinary citizen cannot comprehend uh, what the law on terror section... Uh, what I'm saying, Your Honor, please, is the term public safety is broad enough to include issues of safety of people that may come if from... If that is the case, then why did the Constitution health. make a distinction between public safety or public health? Aside from Section 6, I'm not aware of the Constitution exactly. making that that's distinction, the, Your Honor. That's the only basis that we can say that there is a distinction between public safety and public health. Is that not true? My understanding is that they may overlap, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Jock. Now you mentioned that the anti-terrorism law based on your manifestation is unconstitutional by reason of the doctrine of void or vagueness. Is that correct? That is one of our arguments, Your Honor. And then you mentioned that it violates the right of a person to or the accused to be informed of the nature and cause of accusation against him, right? Yes, Your Honor. In fact, the underlying principle to determine the validity of a statute applying the void for vagueness doctrine is that test is that of notice. Is that correct? Fair notice, Your Honor. Fair notice. Now, fair notice means simply being a, a person of common understanding, being able to know whether his acts or omission is covered by the penal statute. Is that not correct? That is correct, Your Honor. And the reality of it is that when you talk of understanding or being notified as to the effect of a statute penal at that on the individual, could mean this simply mean what? It appeals to a person's common sense. Is it not? It is understood by the It person. is understood by measuring with a person's common sense. Because a person absent mentally challenged would know whether what he is doing or intend to do or fail to do will be covered by the law, right? Yes, Your Honor. Exactly. And therefore, when you talk of notice, it relates to the constitutional provision on the right to be informed of the nature and cause of accusation against him, right? Yes, Your Honor. In fact, authorities, can you flash the re recent decision on Bimaya? You, sorry, uh, Justice Jonen. I have no choice, but I have to refer to you as cases. <laughs> because we derive the doctrine of uh, void for bigness on U.S. jurisprudence. By the way, Attorney Jokno, at what point in time can an individual invoke void for bigness as a defense? Well, our understanding based on the Dicini case, Your Honor, is that it can apply to a facial challenge together with overbreath. At what point in time? Meaning, at what point may a dependent? As long raise. as the requirements for a facial challenge are present, Your Honor, it could no, be I'm part talking of a about facial challenge. Void for vagueness. I'm sorry, Your Honor, I, I'm afraid I don't okay. quite get to your question. 
Boy, the doctrine of void for vagueness is actually a matter of defense. Is that that correct? To avoid prosecution? That is one of the ways it is used, yes. Your Honor. Yes. And at what point in time, usually, based on your readings of jurisprudence on the doctrine of void for, void for vagueness, when are, when, at what point in time is this usually invoked? It may happen in when there is an actual prosecution. However, there is case exactly. there when there is that already, allow facial there challenge. There is already an actual prosecution, right? In other words, void for vagueness may be invoked as a rule either at the time of arrest or after conviction. If you look at the jurisprudence, is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. That okay. is one of the ways it and can be therefore, Void for vagueness could apply only if there is an actual case. The, if there is an actual case, but it may be used um, as a ground for facial challenge if we but the follow rule is the that decision should, ruling, Your Honor. You can raise that as a defense when there is already an actual case because either you are arrested or convicted. Is that not the trend of jurisprudence on void for vagueness? Yes, Your Honor. However, there are situations where we can. In other words, wait. there could be pre something like peremptory challenge, pre uh, even before the law is implemented, you can raise that. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Now. Right. According to this uh, case of uh, De Maya, Vagueness doctrine represents a procedural, not a substantive demand. Meaning that when you talk of void for vagueness, you should look at it from the point of view of procedural due process. Is that not correct? I believe the first test, the completeness test, may be looked at as a procedural test. Okay. However, if the second test as far as providing okay. uh, whether it gives sufficient standards to law enforcers to implement, I believe that that's the second part. Yes, Your Honor. The second part. But if basically, the void for vagueness doctrine is essentially an issue of procedural due process, right? For the first part of the test, yes. Yes. So when you speak of procedural due process, we talk about how a person is to be prosecuted under a penal statute. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. The Constitution says, can you take that? Okay. It says in Section 14, second paragraph, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall be presumed innocent until the contrary is proved, etc., to be informed of the nature and cause of accusation against him. That is the essence of procedural due process, right? Yes, the sir. law that hears before it's condemned. Yes, Your Honor. Is that correct? Now, proceeding from that premise, if a person is accused, okay, under Section 4 of the anti-terrorism law, the information will not enumerate the substantive law enumeration under Section 4. Is that not correct? You do not restate the elements of Section 4, if one is to be prosecuted for violation of Section 4. Is that not correct? The information must allege the material elements yes. of the Yes, under crime, Section 6 of Rule uh, 110, a complaint or information is sufficient if it alleges the acts or omissions complained of as constituting the offense charge. Is that not correct? That is correct, Your Honor. In other words, the, uh, the basic elements provided in Section 4, is given flesh in an information by way of allegations of specific factual matters, right? Yes, Your Honor. That will put into the definition of the offense. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Since the issue when void for vagueness is the lack of notice, which is equivalent to the right to be informed of the nature and cause of accusation against the person, is that not correct? The term notice would refer to the right to be informed, right? They are connected, Your Honor. Exactly. And in that section, it says, in all criminal prosecutions, which is judicially defined as that starting from arraignment up to trial, right? That is the duration of criminal prosecution. If at the arraignment, 
the accused charged under Section 4 under an information with alle which alleges all the factual circumstances consisting of acts or omission constituting violations of Section 4. At the arraignment, if his counsel okay, explains to him, which is under the rule on arraignment, it's important that the information must be explained to an accused, right, in a language understood by him. And if necessary, it has to be translated. Is that not correct? Yes, that is correct. And therefore, if the lawyer is able to explain to, the, to the, his client the specific allegations that matches the elements of the offense, there is no violation of the right to be informed. Is that not correct? That is correct, Your Honor. And therefore... May I just add, if the information itself contains all the material Yes, exactly, elements. because that's what Section 6 says. Sufficiency, right, of information, the allegations of, as to dax or omission, and all the aggravating and whatever yes. circumstances. Yes, all of those are contained... All of those, if they are contained in the information, that would be a valid information, right? Yes, Your Honor. And if there is lacking allegation as to the elements, Okay, vis a vis the factual allegation, uh, the factual allegations as to acts or omission, you can move to quash, right? <coughs> that is correct. That right. is your remedy. <coughs> and in fact, if you do not find the allegations sufficient to your client as to its clearness, you can ask for a file a motion for bail of particulars. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor. In other words, the right to information or notice is possibly given at the time the accused is arraigned. And you will not violate his right. You cannot. You will not violate his right to be informed. Is that not correct? As far as the right to be informed. Because you explain to him, vis a vis the requirement of uh, void for vagueness, as to notice of what you are being charged. Is that not correct? Well, the right to be informed, if you're on a police, is not dependent on how well counsel explains to the accused. Uh, what the elements are contained in the information. The right to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation is a constitutional requirement that the charges must, must be clear. Be clear. Precisely. Yes, it must be clear to him and he must understand the charges. Yes, Your Honor. And therefore, the void for vagueness will disappear because the lawyer explained to him exactly what are the terms by which he is indicted. Is that not the case? If you're on a please, while the two concepts are connected, I believe that the void for vagueness is a different concept from the right to be informed because it has two different elements. One is fair notice to the citizen, We're talking and the here. other is proper standards for law enforcement. I know. These are the two twin facets of that is void not for found vagueness. In the right the to first, be informed. as I said earlier, I premise it that the crucial element for purposes of invalidating legislations on the reason of void for vagueness is that essence of notice, right? May I respectfully disagree, Your Honor? In the Decini case, the crucial element of void for vagueness was the lack of proper standards to guide law enforcers such that enforcement of the law would be arbitrary. Okay. Let me go to another point. Look at that slide on terrorism as defined in, under Australian law. Is there much difference from our provisions on terrorism under Section 4? Um, based on my very quick glance at it, Your Honor, I... Well, I would say that it does not... Uh, it, it does require still actions that are criminal in nature. That yeah, but if, if you look at, you were saying that you object to the definition of anti-terrorism law because it violates your free speech clause, right? Huh? Is that what you're telling us? Telling Se us earlier? Section four in relation to section nine, five, six, eight, and ten. Let, 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 we'll go to speech. that later. That we'll go to that. But in the meantime, you're saying that it, the definition, okay, uh, affects or rather impairs your constitutional right of free speech, right? Is that what you're saying? That we are saying that the definition, Your Honor, is overbroad and void for vagueness. Yes, because it impairs your constitutionally guaranteed political civil rights. But look at the paragraph three 
of the Australian terrorism law. What does it say? It refers to advocacy, protest, etc., Your Honor. Yes. Can you relate them to paragraph A of section 101? It says that the terrorist acts means an act or threat of action where A, the action falls within subsection 2, right? But does not fall within subsection 3, right? Yes, Your Honor. And we have the same, the same provision in section 4 of our no, on definition of terrorism it says that it does not fall is advocacy protest dissent or industrial action and is not intended to cause serious harm is that not the same practically yes, it's just Honor, a textual presentation that makes the difference i am not aware of whether the jurisprudence and the constitution itself of australia are the same as the jurisprudence and understanding no, we have in our country. but we're talking here of terrorism as an internationally recognized crime. Yes, Your Honor. However, and there is the commonality law... in terms of definition of terrorism. I'm just citing to you that as far as Australian Commonwealth, this is one of the forerunners in fighting terrorism, practically our provision is if not a verbatim, but obviously they are the same. Well, the definitions may be similar, Your Honor. The treatment, as far as the courts are concerned, I cannot say they are the same, because the jurisprudence there is probably different from the jurisprudence here. Are you telling us that with those exactly the same words, they can be interpreted in different jurisdictions? Well, I can only speak for what we have in our country, Your Honor. And I believe it is very clear in our country that any kind of peaceful exercise of civil and political rights, regardless of the intent, in fact, is protected we're in by fact, the Constitution. In fact, would you not say that we are better off? Because there's, an, as I said earlier, there is a black and white statement under Section 4 that those political uh, civil rights are excluded, subject only to that last uh, provision. The problem, Your Honor, is not black and white. If the proviso simply said that terrorism does not include the peaceful exercise exactly. of civil and political rights, period, Unless, there would be no problem. However, it does not say that. It said it removed the word peaceful and replaced it with intended to. And that now gives a window for the enforcers, even if, if a exercise of rights is peaceful, to, see, to still say your intent, the intent of this person is to cause etc. And therefore, even if you are exercising your rights peacefully, you could still be committing okay. terrorism. That is our problem with the Can you post that Iran. picture of the translation in Quiapo? There, there is a slide that we took up from Al Jazeera and uh, I think Philippine Star. Okay. That is a mass action, is that not correct? It would appear so. I'm not familiar, Your Honor, with the pictures, but it would appear no, that so. That is a picture taken during the celebration of translation in Quiapo. So a religious gathering, okay. Your Honor. That's a mass action, right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Can those people who participated in that mass action be prosecuted for anti-terrorism under Section 4? If the law enforcer reads the law and says that no, under se, the law they are engaging in acts intended to exactly. cause death or endanger a person's life. In first, you look at the pictures per se. Okay. Can they be prosecuted that mass gathering? That is precisely our problem, Your Honor, with that section. Yeah. That because it says it, it includes acts intended to endanger person's lives under the pandemic, the, the physical act of gathering together is already but an if you look at of the entire lives. context of the law on terrorism, that mass gathering there will only be covered if you took into account what is provided in the law, which is what the purpose, nature, and context. Context is that that right? Yes, Your Honor. And this purpose, nature, and context becomes evident when there is an external action, right? Well, if the same photograph, Your Honor, showed demonstrators holding up placards calling for the president to step down, etc. That is precisely what I'm trying to drive at. 
to be able to know whether you are punished, whether your act is punishable under the anti-terrorism law, you have to provide, you have to prove the purpose, the context, and the nature of that mass action. You have to prove the purpose, and that exactly. is done by looking at the nature and the but context, Your Honor. Contrary to your statement that every mass action puts in doubt whether you can be prosecuted or not under the anti-terrorism law. Well, not every mass action, but definitely some Precisely, types of mass actions. Precisely, to be actions. able to know whether they are covered by that provision of law, you have to consider, and the prosecutor should be able to allege in the information that the purpose, the nature, and the context fits within the definition of Section 4 of the anti-terrorism law. Is that not correct? It would also depend on the intent, Your Honor, because the first element or the first portion of Section 4 requires not only acts, but acts intended to a certain purpose. Yeah, but so there are two elements of, of state of mind, Your Honor, at least in the law. The first is acts intended to, so you still look at the, at the subject. But you do not state isolate mind. that intended with purpose, because otherwise you cannot have. You cannot say that whether your acts or omission falls within section four. The law, yes, because requires. Because you, you have to look and analyze to determine whether an act or omission is covered by section four under the terrorism law. Because aside from the enumerations of acts intending to, you have to consider the succeeding paragraphs and the rest of the provision of the law. You the, cannot isolate that. The law requires a requisite intent and purpose, and they are separately provided in the law. Correct, but you do not limit the interpretation of section four solely on the basis of intent and purpose, because you have to consider the nature of the act and the context by which the act or omission was done. Is not that the case? To determine the purpose, yes, Your Honor. To determine whether or not that act or omission falls within the definition of Section 4 of the anti-terrorism law. Is that not the, the way should you, we should read the law? That it requires both a requisite intent, acts intended to, and okay. A purpose which is all to be determined by the nature and okay, context. Let me go to yes, another Your point. In your uh, opening statement, you also mentioned this. Where is that? Ah, here. First, uh, first page. The ATA punishes its speech based on its content. Section 4, defining terrorism mentions advocacy, protest, mass action, which are all forms of expression. Section 9 punishes inciting others by means of speech to commit terrorism. Sections 5, 6, and 8, and 10 punish threats and proposals to co commit terrorism, training, recruitment, so on and so forth. What are in Kuwait offenses? Well, my understanding is that they are offenses that have not yet blossomed into an actual consummated crime. Are in Kuwait offenses punishable under our jurisdiction? Well, the anti-terror law does state that uh, regardless of the stage of execution, these acts are punishable. Other than the anti-terror law, do we punish uh, in Kuwait offenses? When the le yes, Your Honor, there are certain occasions when that is And done. when you talk of in Kuwait offenses, there is a target offense. Yes, Your Honor. And what is the purpose why do we penalize these in Kuwait offenses? Well, because of the perceived evil uh, to the state. So in other words, you can penalize in Kuwait offenses as a preventive measure so that the target crime sh should not occur, right? Yes, sir. Right? Exactly, that is the reason why there are those provisions in the nature of in Kuwait offenses in the anti-terrorism law to be able to prevent the actual happening of a terrorist act, correct? That appears to be the And purpose. along those in Kuwait offenses also is the authority or the, as Justice Jordan said, there should be tools to prevent the commission of the actual terrorist attack. Is that not the case? Yes, Your Honor. So in other words, those enumerations under 
the anti-terrorism law, which are in the nature of inchoate offenses, must be punished with the objective precisely of preventing a terrorist attack. Is that not the case? As long as, Your Honor, they do not stifle broadly on fundamental rights, and that is our position, that these particular sections, which are content-based restrictions on speech, okay. stifle protected speech. Taking from your that statement, if, for example, there is a training camp somewhere in Mindanao training jihadist fighters, and there is somebody who is teaching them how to make IED device. Is that covered by protected speech? That is not covered here. Yeah. Obviously. So the context must be taken into account whether or not that free speech is in violation of the anti-terrorism law. Our you cannot generalize that every speech is protected because the right to speech is all not unrestricted, right? Jurisprudentially determined that it's not absolute, right? It is subject to certain restrictions, right? Yes, it is also clear. And the typical our... uh, uh, example, as we studied in law school, is you cannot shout fire, fire inside the theater, right? Do you recall that case? Yes, Your Honor. It's also okay. clear from our jurisprudence that uh, advocacy of lawless action is only punishable if it is imminent lawless action and it is likely to succeed. Now let me go back to notice. According to the void for the vagueness doctrine, notice is essential because I want to focus because that's really the reason why there's such thing as void for vagueness. Why cases reaches the Supreme Court? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Why cases reaches the Supreme Court? Why do cases reach the yes. court? Well, um, because the counsels in those cases are not content with the rulings below if it came from a lower court. And the mode by which a case as a general that reaches the Supreme Court is under Rule 45, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Purely question of law. Appeals by certiorari. And you will admit that even the text of the law is so clear, it reaches the Supreme Court under Rule 45. Is that, that right? There may be occasions when that is true, Your Honor. However, we submit that this case is not one of them. Yeah, but the reality and actuality is that even if the text of the law is so clear, right, and gives you proper notice on how the law should apply, still, they question what? We submit that this case is different, Your Honor, from those cases. We submit that the law in this particular case, in terms of providing fair notice to the ordinary citizen, does not satisfy that test. Is it your contention that uh, it is a must that there be predicate offenses for purposes of anti-terrorism law? Our contention is that that appears to be the norm among nations, that either a predicate crime or a criminal act is required. So this anti-terrorism law is a new development, correct? Yes, In response to what's happening in the world right now. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Now, Kudita did not exist until after EDSA, right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. In fact, in the beginning, those who took part in these activities were charged under rebellion, correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Okay. But Congress saw it the necessity to provide an autonomous offense of Kudita, right? That is correct, Your Honor. And it is now under Article 134-A of the Revised Penal Code, right? Yes, Your Honor. Take a look at how Kudita is defined under 134-A. How committed? The crime of Kudita is a swift attack. Is that not so broad? No, Your Honor. It's still a criminal act. No, no, it's no. It's an attack. From, Therefore, it, it's Yeah, but when you clear. say swift attack, is that not broad? Not in my opinion, Your Honor. I would if, not a, say. if somebody uses a samurai and uh, decapitates, is that a swift attack? Well, the words swift attack are qualified by the... Exactly. Qualified by the other elements of the offense. Is that yes, not correct? Honor. So in other words, when you interpret Section 4, you should also consider the qualifiers in the provisions of the law. 
Yes, Your Honor, and that's our exactly, problem, that's the qualifying provisos in Section, section 4, 4 provides are problematic. certain acts and then certain purpose, but subject to certain qualifiers to be understood as falling within the provision of Section 4. Is that not correct? I believe Your Honor is referring as a qualifier to the proviso portion, the last part of Section 4. Oh. Our problem with that, Your Honor, as I mentioned earlier, is that it is based on a flawed understanding of the Constitution, that you that the exercise of civil and political rights, if the intent is wrong, can already be punishable. We submit, Your Honor, that the exercise of civil and political rights, so long as it is peaceful, regardless of the intent in the mind of the actor, is protected. And that is not considered by the proviso in Section 4, Your Honor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jok. No? May thank I ask you, the counsel for the last... Uh, just one question, uh, Mr. Chief Justice. Attorney Latif? Thank you, Attorney Jokno. Attorney Latif, in your petition, you you are saying that uh, the anti-terrorism law is unconstitutional because it under the repealing clause, uh, it repealed the Human Security Act. Is that correct? Uh, particularly with respect to Section 40, 41 and Section 50. Which refers to what? Your Honor, please. What are you referring to? What are those provisions that you are saying that by reason of the repeal of Human Security Act under the anti-terrorism law, what are those provisions that you are referring to? You refer, Your Honor, to Section 41 and Section 15 of the Human And what Security are those uh, sections provide for? It provides for 500,000 penalty uh, compensation in the event that the accused is acquitted, Your Honor. In other words, those provisions in the Human Security Act guarantees compensation by way of damages, right? That is correct, Your Honor. Okay. Take a look at Article 35 of the Civil Code. This plus Section 35. What does it say? Independent can... civil actions. Can you read it, please? I cannot read it, Your Honor. Oh, sorry. It simply says... And we know this, Article 35 of the Civil Code provides that any violations committed by an officer or even a private individual in violation of guaranteed constitutional rights entitles that person or victim to damages. Will that not provision of Article 35 answer your, uh, will, not, uh, will that be sufficient to address your concern as far as the repeal of that? provision of the Human Security Act on compensation? It will not, Your Honor, because uh, Section 41 and Section 50 of the Human Security Act specific, specifically provides for 500,000 compensation per day of... Uh, uh, in other words, your disagreement year. is as regards the amount. E, not only the amount, Your Honor, the provision per se, Your Honor, because Civil Code did not provide particular amount of uh, award, Your Honor. Yeah, but damages are subject to proof. Is that not correct? But in this case, Your Honor, in Human Security Act, there is no proof required, Your Honor. The only proof required, Your Honor, is as long as a person... So your question is to the amount person. that may be recovered. Is that not correct? I, yes, Your Honor. Oh, I see. So there is no issue that you can avail of Article 35 if you want to recover damages from violators under the anti-terrorism law. But only your concern is the amount which was guaranteed under the Human Security Act. Not only that, Your Honor, under Section under Art Section 41 and 50, Your Honor, the only proof, Your Honor, required to a person is that he is acquitted. In he is acquitted? Case, yes, Your Honor. But acquitted. look at those provisions of Article 35. It, does it mention there those who are wrongfully charged? Is it not there? Huh? Can you flash down the other part? See? Still, Your Honor, the acute, the... See? The right against the probation of property without due process of law, so on and so forth. Practically enumerating all the fundamental rights, you can recover for damages. This... And this requires only preponderance of evidence. Yes, Your Honor. Precisely, Your Honor, in Section 41 and Section 50, of uh, Human Security Act, Your Honor, 
It is our submission, Your Honor, that it is conclusive. Once you are acquitted, Your Honor, you are entitled to 500,000, Your Honor. That is the reason, Your Honor, that only one person was uh, convicted here in based on plea bargaining. In fact, Your Honor, in the so, case of Madame... So in other words, you are not satisfied with the guarantee under Article 35 of the Civil Code that you can recover damages? Yes, Your Honor, we are not satisfied, Your Honor, because there should be a guarantee of non-repetition of the acts committed, Your Honor. Okay, so in other words, instead of lit litigating under, Art under Article 35, it is your view that since Human Security Act fixed the amount, that should be the one to be followed. Is that not correct? Yes, Your Honor, because it favors, Your Honor, the victim, Your Honor. And if you can only prove it with minimal amount of evidence. Okay, thank you, Mr. Attorney Latif. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Mon, Hernando, please. Just a few questions, Chief uh, Attorney Diokno, please. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Uh, You know, last week, right after the first uh, oral arguments, I happened to watch on YouTube uh, Representative Lucy Torres, and where she was explaining how Congress came up with the bill that eventually became this anti-terror act. And I was struck, uh, not just by her beauty, but by the fact of her bemoaning that critics of the law seem to be instilling fear of the law itself in the people, instead of instilling fear of terror, which the law uh, is trying to address. So now we're here to hear your arguments against uh, the validity of the law itself. Uh, would you say that there is any saving grace to the ATA, Attorney Diokno? Or would you want the entire law to be struck down as unconstitutional? I'm sorry, Your Honor. I don't think my microphone is working, Your Honor. Uh, it, it is. We can hear oh, you. I'm sorry. Uh, Unfortunately, Your Honor, given the way that the law defines terrorism in Section 4, uh, we see no way that that can be saved. So it's only, what you would want is only a partial striking down of the law? Well, only Section 4? Well, section 4 defines terrorism and the rest of the provisions of the Anti-Terror Act implement that definition of terrorism, Your Honor. <laughs> From well, sections. there are other provisions in the law, such as proposal to commit treason, etc., etc. A proposal so you, to you would think that striking down Section 4 itself would effectively invalidate the entire statute. That is one of our submissions here, Your Honor. I see. Uh, let, let's just go into some practical questions and applications of the law. If, let's say, those two ATAs, who had been arrested by the police recently were to engage your services as counsel. Uh, what would you do to protect their rights under the ATA? Well, I would, uh, of course, look at any possible attacks that could challenge the law as applied to them, Your Honor. Would you immediately question their detention under the, the ATA on the ground that they're being held arbitrarily? by the police? If the facts were to show that they were not lawfully arrested, then uh, I would probably do that, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. You would question their detention if, let's say, it lasts beyond three days, because it would be against the Constitution? That could be a possible argument I would raise. It's very hard to say unless I get to confer with my clients and determine what really happened, Your Honor. Okay. If, let's say, they're now on the 10th day of their detention, then you could possibly argue that they're, they are being held beyond the uh, period of detention that is allowed under the Constitution, which is three days. That is an, an open argument, Your Honor, yes. All right, but going, that, going into the three-day period in the Constitution, 
I remember that when it was uh, crafted into uh, as part of the Constitution by the Constitutional Commission, the intent was that it would cover only uh, detention by reason of rebellion or insurrection and when there is suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, isn't it? That is the literal wording of the Constitution, Your Honor. Yes. So we would have to interpret, therefore, the Constitution in that manner strictly. And that is to mean that, or that is to say that the three-day period would only refer to the detention in case of rebellion or insurrection and when there is suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. Okay. In other words, and I, I re remember this vividly when Commissioner Padilla talked about this particular provision of the Constitution, he meant that it shall cover only rebellion or insurrection and when there is suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. In other words, it was left to Congress to determine another period for detention with regard to other offenses. And this would already uh, entail exercise by Congress of its policy-making process in crafting laws. So I would say that we could possibly interpret the ATA as one such act in which Congress can extend the three-day period. Well, that is not part of our petition, Your Honor. My understanding is that the argument goes like this, that, well, in the Constitution, we consider martial law, invasion, or rebellion, suspension of the writ as the gravest of emergencies that could ever face a country. And if for that kind of grave emergency, you can only detain a person without charges for three days, our submission is that that should apply across the board even to other crimes, including terrorism. But in the deliberations of the Constitutional Commission, they expressly left out offenses under the RPC and other acts that may be defined by Congress as criminal offenses. Well, the, that Section 18 really does well, refer to your Honor did to, not in, uh, trivialize. It really does uh, refer to invasion and rebellion, Your Honor. No, I mean the Constitution did not uh, interfere with 125 in any manner, no? No, Your Honor. Yes, which is why there was that expression by Commissioner Padilla that the three-day period in the Constitution should only be interpreted to cover rebellion, insurrection, and when there is suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. So that means to say that Congress can, in fact, come out with a statute that would lengthen the period of detention in another offense that it would define, like terrorism under the ATA. Well, the Constitution expressly makes that reference, if Your Honor, please, to invasion and rebellion. It's our submission that, that the intent or the spirit of the Constitution was to provide that as a maximum cap, that when you have the gravest of emergencies like an invasion or rebellion, the most that you can detain a person is three days without charges. And we submit that that should apply across the board to all other offenses. All right. Uh, the fear of terrorism is now so per pervasive worldwide, no? which is why we are practically all nations coming up with their own respective anti-terrorism acts or laws. That is correct, Your Honor. Uh, in Southeast Asia, would you know uh, uh, which countries uh, have come up with anti-terror laws like I have, ours? Uh, I have not made a study, Your Honor, but I do know that uh, probably all the ASEAN countries have Yes. Laws. Yes. For instance, Indonesia has one. The period of detention is uh, two days plus extension of 120. You know? Pakistan, 30 days. Uh, Malaysia, 59 plus two years extension. You know? And Singapore is tops 730 days plus indefinite uh, detention. So these countries uh, obviously recognize that terrorism is such that it has to be nipped uh, by all costs in the ban. Well, we submit, if you're on a please, that those laws may be valid based on the constitutions of those respective countries. 
And I believe we're familiar that uh, we know that Malaysia and Singapore in particular have always been, um, has have always favored the interests of the state as far as detention is concerned. I believe Malaysia has had a preventive detention law for many, many years and the same with uh, Singapore. Well, but just like uh, part you know, nations who are part of the United Nations, I'm sure they crafted this in accordance with UN security regulations. Huh? Well, that is subject That is perhaps. to be the presumption. Yes. All right. Now, uh, we've been hearing a lot about the, the ATC, the Anti-Terrorism Council. And judging from news reports and uh, criticisms and uh, so on and so forth, the ATC is made to appear like it's the KGB, you no? Know? But who composed this uh, ATC, uh, Attorney Diokro? I believe, Your Honor, the ATC is chaired by the Executive Secretary, mm -hmm. and the members consist of the cabinet-level uh, officials from the Executive Department, Your Honor. Yes, Secretary of Finance, Secretary of Justice. Yes, Your Honor. The ILG, the FA, uh, et cetera. No? Yes, Your Honor. In other words, these are not the... Uh, uh, people on horseback, no? they are members of the cabinet who are there to assist the president and the country to see to it that security of the nation is preserved. Now, when, when it comes to the designation by the ATC, uh, let's say of a person as a terrorist, can the policeman immediately arrest that person by reason of that designation? From the literal wording, Your Honor, of the anti-terror law, it would appear that they can. I don't think position. so. Because if you would read the ATA, <laughs> or Donor Jokno, that designation is only a preventive measure by the ATC preparatory to filing a freeze order with the AMLAC. It's not meant as an instrument to arrest people. I think that should be made clear to all the petitioners. So it's only a, uh, a tool so that the funds of the terrorists can be frozen by the state in order to be uh, taken into custody and not be used anymore for any act of terrorism. Now, also, would the act of designation by the ATC uh, be a uh, basis for the police to already conduct a surveillance well, on the designated person? If I may, Your Honor, Section 29 on detention without judicial warrant is broad enough to include a person designated by the Anti-Terror Council because it makes reference to a person suspected of committing and when one has been designated by the Anti-Terror Council, I believe that uh, would give rise at least to an inference that he is suspected of committing a terrorist act. Uh, Therefore, it would give authority to law enforcers to, to effect an arrest. Already a warrantless arrest? It would appear to be so, based on the wording of Section 29, Your Honor. But, but isn't it that the... When Congress deliberated on the warrantless arrest feature in the ATA, they meant this to cover the situations in Rule 113, Section 5. Uh, there in flank grant, uh, uh, delicto, and hot pursuit. There that, appears that is what uh, I, I have researched on. No? Legislative intent is to limit the warrantless arrest to those under Section 5 of Rule 113, uh, which refers to warrant arrest for all kinds of offenses. If that were the case, Your Honor, then why would there be a need for a 14-day prolonged detention? If the arrest was made in flagrante delicto, there is more than enough evidence to hold that person. There's no need to gather evidence. The Senate deliberations would appear to show that the reason they asked for a 14-day or 24-day detention was so that they could do a proper case build up. But if, if this provision refers to Rule 113, there's no need for a prolonged period of detention because the 
evidence is already there by the fact that they were caught in the act of committing a crime. Well, no that's, because build up the case. that's in recognition of the fact that terrorism is uh, a different kind of offense, no? where police would need to dig deeper. It's not just any ordinary crime like murder or homicide or robbery. It's a crime uh, that's sui generis, no? which is why we have this ADA. Uh, anyhow, so uh, the ATC so can the, now going back to the one of the powers of the ATC, which is to uh, give an authority in writing to police. Uh, I've said that does, that does not mean that upon designation of a person as a terrorist, he can already be arrested by the police. No, because that designation is under the ATA only for the purpose of application of a freeze order. That's very clear under the ATA. Now, will that designation in writing be also a ground for ATC itself to freeze already the funds of the alleged terrorists? I believe that would be within the power of the Anti-Money Laundering Council, yes. Iran, not the ATC. In other words, that's, that's a safeguard provided by the law, isn't it? It could be viewed as such, yes, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. So we can therefore retain these provisions of the ATE as reasonable enough under the circumstances, and it need not be struck down. Um, if you're on it, please, I, as I understand the arguments, although that is not in our petition, uh, the, the concerns about the Anti-Terror Council are, number one, that it is an executive body that answers directly to the president. Therefore, it's not an independent body like a court. No due process, no evidence is required before they make a decision on designation or prolonged detention. That is one of our concerns. For example, Your Honor, if let's say the president tomorrow were to announce publicly that so and so are terrorists, I believe that the Anti-Terror Council would have no choice but to push through and carry forward that pronouncement of the president, regardless of whether there is evidence or not to support it, because they all answer directly to the president. Well, that would be speculative, no, Attorney Diokno, because uh, obviously, uh, it's not. It's just the president saying it, and not the ATC actually following up on it. Anyhow, uh, with respect again to the designation by the ATC of a person as a terrorist, can the police immediately conduct a surveillance upon him based on that designation? Well, based on the provision on surveillance, if you're on a police, I believe that would require a court authority. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not within my, the issues that our petition is raising, but that is my understanding of the yes, provision. Yes, but, but that's one of that's the issues raised against the law itself. No? Yes, that's one of the issues raised against the law. Uh, but again, I, I think we can safely say that the ATA, ATA does provide uh, safeguards with respect to surveillance. It's not a, an executive function under the ATA, but is a purely judicial function. ATC, or I mean the law enforcement agencies, would have to file with the court an ex parte application to conduct a surveillance. Isn't it? That would appear to but be the case. Do yeah. they need to get a written authorization from the ATC to conduct, uh, I mean, to apply for an ex parte application? I believe there is a requirement. However, I have not studied that aspect. Yes, that is required under the ATA. Again, would you say that, that there, there is added safeguard towards uh, protecting the welfare of the people against invasion of their privacy? by the fact that the law requires that any law enforcement agency before conducting any surveillance would have to have first a written authorization from the ATC. Well, that, that is an additional requirement. Yes, it is, Whether obviously. Whether would no? be a safeguard is a matter of opinion, I believe, Your Honor. Because if the ATC were to operate as a thumb, 
as a simple approving authority without discernment, then it would not be a safeguard at all. So obviously, that's one good provision that is there in the ATA. Mm, it would depend. The, the problem, Your Honor, is whether the ATC would have sufficient standards to make that decision um, independently of any anyone in the executive department. Mm. Uh, th this uh, feature in the ATA has been there before in the Human Security Act of 2007. Your Honor is referring to surveillance? Uh, yes, no, Your Honor. No, the written authorization. I'm not uh, aware, Your Honor. Yes, 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 it's been there. Uh, carry over from the HSA of 2007. And would you know if uh, in the experience of HSA 2007, there has been any written authorization issued by the, a the then ATC? I'm not aware, Your Honor. Uh, perhaps we could defer to the council yes. who is uh, in charge of surveillance. Yeah. Well, Not from what I know, there has been it. none. There has been none. So there has never been a written authorization to conduct surveillance or anything of that sort uh, in the HSA of 2007. Well, that is all, uh, Attorney Diop. Thank, you, Thank you for your time. Chief, I have no more questions. Thank you. Now, sorry, the uh, five quarter. No, and there are still members of the court who would like to ask uh, questions. So we will proceed next Tuesday, February 16. And uh, what will happen next uh, next next uh, hearing is that we will, the uh, interpolation of the petitioners will be finished thereafter. The amicus care will allow will be allowed to deliver her uh, or his rather. I'm sorry, his position, and then we should have sufficient time then. The respondent will start arguing their, their position, then interpolation will, will thereafter take place. Okay, that's, that's clear now. Lastly, we have uh, seen some uh, lawyers uh, being interviewed in the television stations and even in social media discussing the merits of this case or these cases and also discussing the respective positions, no? Now, uh, we would like to ask the uh, lawyers to please refrain from being interviewed while these cases are pending resolution, you know? You know the effect when one uh, goes, uh, to the, goes into the media and uh, discusses his, uh, his positions, it might affect the uh, outcome no? of, this, uh, of these cases. So please refrain. We do not like that uh, we will use our coercive power, you know? in disciplining lawyers. Uh, I will not mention any more the names. So we're uh, seen in the television stations being interviewed about their respective positions and the merits of the cases. Reminder lang, please, ano? Para uh, we, will not, we will not be uh, affected, okay? So there are there being no other matters in the, today's uh, proceedings, uh, session uh, and hearing will proceed next Tuesday February 16, at 2.30 in the afternoon. We are sorry that we started at 2.30 this afternoon because we ended with our end bank deliberations uh, past 12.30 in the afternoon and we held our deliberation here in the session room and we had to fix the, uh, the room before we could proceed to our to today's uh, deliberation. So, medyo nalit kami ng konti, but uh, it's not intentional that we should be late. It's because that uh, we ended with our end bank session this morning, 12.30, or almost 1 o'clock this afternoon. So, to, so thank you. And uh, there being no other matters, uh, the session is adjourned.